<laughs> okay, we might get stuck, so we want to finish in time for lunch at midday. Very important. Um, so my name is Laura Miller. I work in the Ethnology branch, obviously, and the session that we're going to talk about now is going to give you some more information about the different data sources that we have in the Ethnology branch that you can um, access through us, um, and the types of information you can get from the data sets, and also some of the um, possible limitations and things to think about when you're analysing this data. So this slide just describes the main types of data sources that we have access to. So we've got health administrative data sets, uh, many of which um, are um, administered by the Department of Health. We have access to um, both state and national health-based surveys. We have some geographical and spatial data. We have a lot of social demographic data, and as Peter mentioned, um, it's really important that we have good population data for the types of measures we um, often analyse. Um, we have burden of disease data, which has come up a couple of times this morning, but we'll talk more about that. Um, and we've also got some cost of data that you guys can use. First of all, talking about the administrative data sets. So um, we have a range um, that we have access to, um, and for the dates there are the dates that we have the information for. Probably the most well used um, data set is hospital um, records. Um, we have that information from 1989 up to 2012. And um, when people are admitted to hospital, as you probably know, um, they're getting a diagnosis. Um, so we can then work out, for example, we can select out people who have been diagnosed with having an injury. We can work out what uh, type of injury they had and also to what body part. We can um, look at the external cause of the injury. So, um, whether it was um, caused by um, a road traffic accident, a fall, um, drownings, that sort of thing. Um, and we can also um, pull out information on the activity the person was doing while they were, when they had got the injury, and also the place of occurrence of the injury. Um, in terms of death registrations, um, obviously that's the sort of pointy end of health, sort of worst case scenario, but we can um, identify people who have died um, of things like road traffic accidents, suicides, assaults, that sort of thing, and we have that information up to 2011. We also have some emergency um, attendance data, um, so that's been more recent from 2007 onwards. And again, um, for the metro area especially, we can um, pull out numbers of emergency attendances for various um, injuries. We've also got some other data sets which may um, be sort of less relevant in terms of injury, but um, it's good to let you guys know that we have access to them and they could be useful for other areas of work. So we have mental health occasions of service, um, and within that data set, um, we're also looking at the mental health um, ICD codes, but there are also some um, uh, drug and alcohol related um, codes that we can pull out from that data set. We have cancer data, um, so that's cancer incidence and mortality data, going back to 1982. Um, we have midwives and birth records, um, and also infectious disease notifications. So I'll go into each of the um, data sets in a bit more detail now. Um, but before I do that, just in terms of um, sort of the administrative data sets more generally, and we sort of picked up on this in the request um, exercise you guys were doing, um, a lot of the data sets that we um, um, have access to, we can break them down to, um, into different um, groups, I guess. So you can look at um, how um, the injuries are changing over time, so we get different years, you can look at um, differences by age group, by gender, um, Aboriginality, um, and as we've touched upon, um, you might be looking, interested in looking at specific injuries, so what types of injuries are occurring. You can also um, break down the data by geography, so it could be health districts, um, local government areas, that sort of thing, and also by socioeconomic um, areas, so that's CIFA, socioeconomic indexes for areas, and also um, remoteness, so using the um, accessibility and remoteness index for Australia. So this um, data here just shows that we can break stuff down, for example, by age and also, uh, sorry, by um, gender and by year. And just in terms of the data sets generally, uh, Peter has already mentioned that um, we can't uh, report on really small numbers or um, individual cases uh, for confidentiality reasons. Um, we also need um, a minimum number to run some statistical tests. Um, so we might have to group, for example, um, areas together, or we might have to look across a couple of years to make sure the numbers are big enough. We don't usually provide information by um, specific hospital or um, uh, clinician.
definition, that sort of thing. Um, and um, if you're wanting to look at differences between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, some of the data sets, um, coding isn't great, especially in the death data, but I'll talk about that a bit more in, in a moment. So, going into the hospital data into a bit more detail. Um, so this data set has all hospital admissions um, occurring in WA hospitals. And I guess just need to think about whenever you're looking at any data set, you always want to think about what the purpose of the data set, you know, why was it collected? Um, and this data set was collected um, for um, planning, allocating and evaluating health services. So it's not specifically an injury surveillance uh, register, so we need to bear that in mind. Um, and also there are certain um, exclusions that um, so people who aren't who will not appear in the department in, in this data set. So for example, this data set does not include um, outpatient occasions of service, so um, you'll be missing out on that. Um, and I guess one of the, the positive things about this data set is it's actually got, it's got a lot of information. We can pick out um, not only the number of admissions for certain types of injuries, but we can work out well, how many people does that relate to. Um, and also, I guess, um, we can, we, the, the data is set up in terms of um, people, you can tell when people had, were first admitted, um, for example, for a road traffic accident in Broome, but then were transferred down to a rural hospital. So you can start to see some of the, the flows of patients as well. Um, if people are interested in doing some um, slightly more complicated um, analysis and looking at comorbidities, um, a comorbidity would only be um, coded on the hospital record if the comorbidity actually impacted on that person's reason for being admitted to the hospital. So you just need to bear that in mind. Um, and when we were talking about um, the place of occurrence of the injury, yes, they give that on the hospital data set. Unfortunately, it's not a geographic location. So it's not, if it's a road traffic accident, for example, it doesn't tell you where that road traffic accident happened. It, um, the sort of categories it's coded into is did it happen at home and if it was at home was it in a garden or you know, if it was on a street was it a public own street or a, you know, a local government street that sort of thing and so that's something to bear in mind and obviously um, not everyone is hospitalised when they're injured so it's missing out a big proportion of people so we're not picking up on GP or um, outpatient injuries. In terms of the death data um, I guess the death data includes um, all deaths that occurred in WA um, so you won't be picking up on people who are usually live in WA and who died over interstate or overseas. Um, just to bear in mind with the death data, there's a lag in terms of the registration of deaths. So somebody might die in 2009, but the death might not actually be registered until 2010 or maybe even 2011. Um, some, some, sometimes that's because um, you have to get the coroners need to be involved in terms of determining what the cause of death was. So that um, introduces a bit of delay. And then um, that information takes a bit longer to get to us in terms of working out the cause of death. So that's what we mean about the delay in receiving coded causes of death. Um, also, if you compare some of the um, statistics that we might give you to um, things you might find online from the ABS, because the ABS um, also do um, death statistics, we always report our death data by the year of occurrence of the death, so the year the actual person died, whereas the um, ABS reports um, the year of registration of the death. So just bear that in mind. It's good for me. Again, you can get quite different numbers. And because of the um, delay in the registration, the most recent years um, of death data are actually preliminary and they're likely to change. So if you're looking at trends in death data, the last year that we give you um, is likely to be likely to potentially go up um, as more um, deaths are registered. And in terms of the indigenous status issue, um, a lot of, so when people um, die on their death record, there's a question saying, was this person um, of indigenous background? Unfortunately, not, that question doesn't always get asked by the funeral directors to the families of the deceased, so there's lots of missing data. Um, but the Epic Branch gets over that by um, using data linkage. Um, and basically looks at other da another data set, the hospital data set, to see if that person has been hospitalised, had been hospitalised um, re um, over the past 20 years, and if they have, what was their indigenous status on that record, and if, if, if we've got information, we can bring it across to the death data set. So we try and get around that limitation a bit. In terms of emergency attendancies data, um, so as I mentioned, it's a lot more recent. Um, it's a bit more limited than the hospital inpatient data, so bear that in mind. Um, we've only got um, proper um, diagnosis coding, <coughs> ICD coding, um, for the metro area and 
and um, Bunbury Hospital. So in most of the country um, hospitals, we've just got, or um, in terms of the reason for the person being in ED, we've just got the major diagnostic, the major diagnostic category, which is a lot more broad. Um, and we can't determine the external causes um, of the injury or the place of the occurrence of the injury like we can in the hospital data. Um, so I'll just quickly touch on some of the other data sets. Sarah's going to actually be talking about health survey data in a lot more detail. Um, it's come up a little bit in the request this morning. So in the Department of Health we have um, a number of surveys which we um, run and have access to the data for. So probably the main one that we use is the WA Health and Wellbeing Surveillance System. Um, and it's a phone interview, a representative sample of the um, WA population. We also run a patient evaluation of services survey and um, recently we've started up a WA nutrition survey. Um, but obviously there's also data available at the national level, so um, there are national surveys that would be of use. Um, so we've got um, the Australian Health Survey, it's run by the ABS, and it's just recently had some results out. We've also got data from the um, Australian Early Development Index, so that's a survey of kids when they first reach school. And there's also data from the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, but Sarah will talk more about these. In terms of spatial and geographical data, I guess the idea behind this is that all health events occur in a place. So if people live in certain locations, they get sick in certain locations and they get treatment in certain locations and, and um, it's often important to look at some of these relationships. So we've got um, data on uh, different boundaries, um, we've got the locations of various facilities, um, and you know, we can look at things, um, the locations of alcohol outlets, fast food outlets, tobacco outlets, um, all that sort of stuff. So this, these sort of data sets can be used in maps or in spatial analysis. But Grace will be talking about that a bit more in a moment. And yeah, we mentioned social demographic data, which is really important for giving an idea of the makeup of various areas or various populations. Um, and so you can look at things like the socioeconomic makeup, you know, the sort of levels of deprivation in different areas um, and how remote different areas are. And as um, Peter mentioned, we uh, put together our own population statistics using information from the ABS. Um, so, burden of disease is another data set that you can request from the Department of Health and has come up a couple of times, so we'll go into that in a little bit of detail. Burden of disease is basically a summary health measure, and as Peter mentioned, it is created using a number of different data sets. Um, and the idea of it is to get an idea of overall population health, so not just looking at the hospitalised population or the, the worse off, we're also looking at um, probably, uh, ill health in the community. Uh, it's made up of two sections, um, so there's a mortality part and a disability part. Um, and so the mortality you're measuring the number of years of life lost due to premature death for certain conditions. And disability is the years of life lost due to people living in less than perfect health. So they're alive but they've got a condition in it and it's affecting their health. Um, so what can be useful? Well it's pretty good um, to compare different um, conditions against each other so you can check whether um, how injury is doing in compared to you know, cancer or cardiovascular disease. You can use it to monitor, monitor disparities between different population groups, um, different areas. You can um, specifically look at the non-fatal part of burden disease. It can be split up into the mortality and the disability section, so you can look at the, the disability part in more detail. Um, and we can, of course we've worked out the, the burden of disease, for example, due to injury, we can work out um, how much of that burden is attributed to various risk factors, um, so alcohol is one of them. Um, I guess it can be used in sort of priority setting and planning, and it's also been used in, uh, to inform cost effectiveness studies. Um, so this is just some of the data we have, just to give you an idea. So this, is, this represents the total burden of disease in WA in 2006, um, so it's the leading causes, so cancer um, accounted for the most burden in, the, in 2006. Um, but the coloured bars represent the, um, the amount of burden that's um, due to, first of all, the years of life lost due to premature death, which is the dark blue, and then the light blue is the years of life lost due to living in less than perfect health. Um, so you can see that injury is the fifth leading cause, um, and it's mostly made up of uh, mortality, so people are dying from their injuries, but there is still a, a proportion of injury that obviously um, is where people are living in less than perfect health. And this data can be broken up into sort of uh, more specific con conditions. So this is injury broken up 
into its various components. So again, this is for WA for 2006, and you can see the different categories. We've got road traffic accidents, suicides, self-inflicted injuries, and those are the, the leading causes of injury. Um, but you can also see there's differences um, between males and females. So females have um, a high proportion of falls in terms of their total injury burden. And I guess this slide here is just to give you a bit more information about what else you can do with that, that, that burden of disease data. So we can um, break it up by age group, by gender, um, health region, also um, remoteness categories and socioeconomic categories. We've also got it by um, indigenous status, and we've got information on around 180 different conditions and uh, injuries are, are some of those. Uh, we've also got projections to 2016, and we've also um, quantified the amount of burden that's attributable to various risk factors as well. Um, so one thing to bear in mind with this data is it's actually starting to get a bit old, so the study was done in 2006, so um, that's just something to think about when you're using it. Um, the late, most recent national study was actually 2003, so that's even older, um, but they are actually at the moment um, doing a new national um, Australian burden of disease study, it's just started. Um, based on the new methodology that the, globe, the new Global Burden of Disease Study um, has just um, started publishing on. So this is just a quick slide just to say, um, if you're interested in, in looking at the Global Burden of Disease Study, um, they've published lots of papers in The Lancet, and um, they basically uh, put together a whole new um, sort of improved methodology for measuring burden of disease, and eventually we'll be using this methodology to, to, to update our WA estimates. Um, but yeah, so, and they've also, I guess, um, started to look at a number of extra risk factors as well, which is really good. Now, so um, just in terms of risk factors, we've talked quite a bit about, um, you know, looking at how much of, uh, how many hospitalizations or how many deaths or how much burden is attributable to something like alcohol. Um, well, this is, this is how we do it. Um, so this is this indirect method that Peter was talking about. So we use this thing called a population attributable fraction. Don't worry about the details. The main um, thing we want you to get from this is that in order to, to calculate the number of hospitalizations that were alcohol related, for example, we need to know the prevalence of um, alcohol uh, drinking in society. So we need to know, um, for example, what proportion of the population uh, drink the harmful levels, which we get from surveys. Um, and we also need to know that, okay, if people are drinking heavily, um, or, or harmful, or risky levels, sorry, um, what is their increased risk of being hospitalised for injury or for getting cancer or that sort of thing? So those are the two pieces of information we need to use. We then apply this um, to, we can apply it to burden of disease data or hospitalisations data. Um, and we've, as I mentioned, we've applied it to the burden of disease study. So this is just um, from a report that you can, um, you can get online. Um, so when we ca calculated the total burden of disease in WA in 2006, we also looked at um, nine different risk factors, um, and we worked out that around 29.5% of the burden was attributable to these the comp this combination of risk factors. Um, if you look specifically at injury, of the total injury burden in 2006 in WA, um, around 18% was due to the um, harmful effects of alcohol. Um, so that was using that method um, to look at burden of disease. We can also apply that population attributable fraction to um, hospitalizations. So this is from the um, Epidemiology of Injury Report, um, which is available online. And it's basically telling you the number of um, hospitalizations for alcohol-related community injuries um, by um, gender, um, and <coughs> yeah, using that, that method. So, these, these hospitalizations, these numbers, and, and relate, specifically relate injury, to injury hospitalizations that are specifically related to um, alcohol. Um, and then just quickly touching on the costing data that was mentioned. Um, so we can give you costs for um, hospital admissions um, using um, uh, costs assigned at the national level for diagnostic related groups. We can also derive estimated costs for emergency department attendances based on their, the triage category and the type of hospital. Um, and we are getting the branches hold to getting into um, giving advice on cost effectiveness analyses. Um, so we wanted to look at cost effectiveness of various programs or interventions. And just to flag, there's actually a new cost of injury report um, currently in progress. Um, it's being um, 
conducted by Curtin University, um, and Erica is actually involved in that project, so if you want more information, speak to Erica about that, but I think they're looking at um, getting that together early next year, is the report expected? I think it's finished by the end of this year. End of this year, okay. Probably beginning next year. Okay, cool. So that's in progress, and they're looking at in detail at the indirect and direct costs of injury. So that'd be really good. Um, and just the last slide from me, um, so just to let you know, obviously we've got lots of good data sets, but um, it's good to um, look at what else is available. So the Institute of Health, um, <coughs> Australian Institute of Health and Welfare is a really good website, got a good search engine, stick injury into the um, search box and loads of really interesting um, injury reports will come up. Um, and also the ABS <coughs> website, there's a couple of um, publications we've listed there, if you're sticking the catalogue numbers, um, they'll pop up. And yeah, just the value of the census data as well, just for getting an idea of um, perhaps the populations you've got in your area, um, it's really, really useful. Now I'll pass you over to Sarah, who will talk to you more about the survey data. <coughs> okay, hello everyone. Um, as Laura said, I'm Sarah. Um, I work with the survey data courses in the epidemiology branch. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk to you today about. Um, as Laura mentioned, there's an extensive range of um, data sources and resources that we use to derive health measures. Um, first and foremost, we have the administrative data sets um, that Laura went into detail about. So that includes your hospitalisations, your deaths, um, and the cancer registry sort of information. Um, however, the majority of the WA population doesn't actually go to hospital in any given year. Um, so in a sense, the health of these people, the people who don't go to hospital, um, sort of lies beneath the surface. It's my lovely little iceberg diagram there. Um, and so what we really need to find out is, these people, are they healthy? Um, are they at risk of future chronic conditions but at the moment aren't exhibiting any symptoms? Um, or do they have problems that don't require hospitalisation that can be treated in the community? Um, and this is where survey data is really useful because it allows us to collect information on people um, who aren't recorded in the administrative data sets. Um, and this can be really important because, okay, so if we look at injury as an example, the Australian Bureau of Statistics estimates only 5% of injuries actually require hospitalisation, and other 16% will require treatment from a health professional, um, and the rest won't require treatment from a health professional per se, but will be managed by the person themselves. So that's quite a large proportion of the injury problem um, that we won't get from using hospitalisation data. Um, another great thing about surveys is that they can also collect information on a range of other demographics and risk factors for the respondent um, that you know, also can't be collected through other data sets. And so this allows us to measure then the health and the wellness of the population as a whole. Okay, so Laura had a slide before that was looking at some of the health surveys um, that we often use. Um, I'm going to focus specifically now just on some of those that can be useful um, in the injury um, problem. So they can be conducted both locally and nationally, and at a local level, um, probably the most well used is the WA Health and Wellbeing Surveillance System which is run by the epidemiology branch of the Department of Health. Um, I'll go into more detail on this particular survey in a few slides. Um, national surveys, though, can also be really useful because they provide statewide <coughs> estimates that we can then compare to other states and also to the national average. Um, so as Peter mentioned, it allows us to sort of benchmark how we're going against other areas. Um, some things to keep in mind about national surveys is that they often have smaller sample sizes for the specific state that you're looking at and they often won't be able to break it down into smaller areas within that state. Um, and also, they often also run quite intermittently, so they might only be run every three to four years, um, so it takes a lot longer to identify emerging trends um, within national data. Um, having said that though, um, there are quite a few national data sources that can be used for injury. Um, the Australian and the National Health Survey, which is run by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, this is run approximately every three to four years. Um, it's a household survey, so it's run um, through a face-to-face -face interview with people. Um, and up until 2004-05, um, this survey asked for information on injuries received in the four weeks prior to the interview. Um, and it actually asked for quite a lot of information around that, that injury, um, including the type of injury, the damage caused, um, the activity that you were doing when you incurred the injury, the location of the body that the injury affected, um, any action taken, as well as any long-term health effects on that injury. Um, unfortunately, they haven't actually asked for this injury information since that 2004-05 iteration of the survey. Um, they do still provide some information around risk factors that are often associated with injury, such as alcohol consumption. Um, but yes, yeah, so the most recent date, unfortunately, from that would be 2004-05. Um, 
Um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics also run um, a work-related injuries module, and they conduct this as part of their um, multi-purpose household survey. Um, this collects information about people who have experienced a work-related injury. Um, and again, they ask for the type of injury, how it occurred, um, if any compensation um, was required. Um, this is conducted every four years. It was last run in 2009-10, I believe, so there should be a new one coming up quite soon. Um, finally, the National Drug Strategy Household Survey. This is run by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Um, again, it's uh, run approximately every three years. This survey con is conducted as a mail-out, so people get posted the survey and then um, send it back when they've completed it. It doesn't collect information on injuries um, specifically, um, but it can be quite useful to determine um, the prevalence of risk factors such as alcohol consumption um, and drug use. Okay, so I'll go into a little bit more detail now about the health and wellbeing surveillance system. Um, a lot of the points that I made about this survey can be applied more broadly to other surveys as well, and um, specifically in terms of the benefits and the limitations of using the survey data. Okay, so the health and wellbeing surveillance system um, is a population-based survey. It was established in 2002, um, and it's run continuously since then. So we actually call people every day of the week, except over Christmas, um, and so we get monthly um, batches of data. So a random sample of the Dudbury population is selected from the white pages, um, and they ask to take part in an approximately 25-minute telephone interview. We oversample in um, some of the rural and remote areas of WA to make sure we get enough people in those areas to provide reliable and, and valid statistics estimates. Adults aged 16 years and over um, are asked for the adult survey, and for children under the age of 16 years, an appropriate parent or carer is asked to complete the child survey on their behalf. Uh, once the data is collected, we then weight it um, to adjust for the sampling methods, and then we standardise it to the age and sex distribution of the WA population. And this then allows us to provide population-based estimates as opposed to just a sample estimate. Um, it's also important to um, look at the response rate of any survey that you're using. Um, we're very lucky in that the WA population is very good at filling out our surveys. Um, we have approximately a 75% more response rate and a 90% participation rate for the health and wellbeing surveillance system. Um, and so having, having that um, really good response rate really helps improve our, um, I guess, confidence in the results that we're able to provide. Um, and so whenever you're using survey data, I'd always recommend checking what the response rate is for that particular survey so you can see how representative it is of the population. Can I ask how you get them to fill out such a high rate? Yeah. That's, um, that's, that's phenomenal. There's a few things. I think in general, the WA population is generally much better than the rest of the country in answering surveys. Um, we have a really good survey collection team uh, up at ECU Survey Research Centre. Um, they're very well trained interviewers there. Um, they treat this survey as their baby and they do everything possible to get the person to answer it in a nice way. <laughs> um, we send out approach letters that are signed by our Director General, so I think that really adds some authority behind the survey. Um, and because it's coming from the Department of Health, I think people are um, aware of the importance of it and are very willing to complete it to help us. Um, when we send out the approach letters, we'll often get people calling up to say, oh, I'm not going to be in for the next week because I'm away, but I really want to answer it. Can I spend some money to do some when I get back? And you know, it's great to get that kind of stuff from people. So yeah, probably the main factor I've got down here. Um, in addition, um, the Health and Wellbeing Surveillance System is one of the few in the country that is run on that continuous basis. So as I mentioned before, it's really where we're calling people constantly. And that gives us a great capacity then to analyse trends over time. Um, but it also means that our estimates aren't affected by seasonality as well. Um, so data from the Health and Wellbeing System is used um, quite extensively within the department for a number of performance indicators. Um, it's also used at a national level, um, as well as for specific requests that we get from you know, local government areas, NGOs, um, and universities. Okay, so a little bit of a busy slide, but I guess I just wanted to um, illustrate all the sorts of areas that the survey covers. Um, so for each respondent, we're able to collect information on a wide variety of health-related variables. Um, so under the chronic conditions, this is where we ask people about their injury, um, but we also ask around physiological risk factors, um, their lifestyle risk factors, their levels of physical activity, um, alcohol consumption, nutrition, etc. Um, there's also a lot of questions around um, their socio demographics. Um, so it makes it a very rich data source for us to use. Okay, so I'll look specifically now at some of the questions in the health and wellbeing surveillance system on injury. 
Um, everyone, that's adults and children, are asked a question um, about whether they had an injury in the past 12 months that required treatment from a health professional. If they say yes to this, they're then asked if that injury was a fall. Um, so this question has been asked consistently for adults since 2002, and it's been asked for children since 2007. Um, so based on this, we can then provide a population prevalence of injury overall, um, as well as the estimated number of people in the, po in the population who um, that this equates to. Um, and as Peter was mentioning before, this is technically called period prevalence because we're asking over the last 12 months. Um, we can also provide the mean number of injuries or falls experienced. And I'll just show you sort of a typical output that we would provide to someone who requested injury data from us. So you can see this table here is looking at the prevalence of injury, and that's always stated as a percent, because we're looking at the proportion of the population that it affects. Um, we can break it down by sex. Um, we can also break it down by um, other different breakdowns, such as age group, um, health region or area, um, some socio-demographic variables. Um, sometimes this will be restricted based on the numbers that we have in those areas, and as Peter mentioned before, um, having the appropriate numbers to run a statistical test and also for confidentiality as well, it's important. Um, so if we looked at this, we can say that almost one quarter of the WA population in the past 12 months self-reported an injury um, that required treatment by a health professional, and this equates to approximately 446,000 people. Um, we can also say that falls accounted for almost one quarter of injuries, um, and that overall 6.6% .6 of the population reported a fall injury in the last 12 months, which is approximately 120,000 people. Okay, um, we also asked some questions in the survey about alcohol consumption, um, which would be useful given the exercise that we're doing later. Um, so adults are asked questions around the number of drinks on a typical drinking day, as well as the number of drinking days they have in a typical week. And from this, um, we are then able to classify people according to the NHMRC guidelines um, in terms of their risk for short-term and long-term harm from alcohol. Um, so these questions have been asked consistently since 2002. Um, and again, we can get a prevalence uh, of adults consuming alcohol at risky levels for them to them. Okay, so just in general, some benefits of, um, of using the survey data, and in particular the health and wellbeing scale system, is that it does give us a capacity to analyse trends over time. Um, and depending on the frequency of collection, this can also be applicable to other surveys as well. Um, another advantage is that because we collect information on a wide variety of variables for each respondent, it gives us the ability to look at interactions between variables. So we, for example, we might be able to look at um, levels of injury amongst people who do a lot of physical activity versus people who say that they don't do a lot of physical activity. Um, because we're just going to select from all over the state, um, we can look at um, geographic breakdowns of the data. Um, we can go down to, in theory, LGA, but again, often this will determine, be determined on the levels of, of numbers of people that we have in each LGA and whether we can provide this. Um, and of course, we can always compare to the state um, or the metro area or another comparison that you're looking for. Um, the biggest benefit of the survey data, um, I think, is that it can probably provide important information on injuries that are not severe enough to require hospitalisation. Um, and we've recently done some work um, using data linkage. So we followed some of the results of the survey and then we've looked at their hospitalisation data. Um, and only 7.2% of injuries that were reported were subsequently treated in hospital. Um, and if we extrapolate that to the WA population, um, it means that there's approximately 1,040 injuries sustained every day that are serious enough to require treatment from a health professional but don't require hospitalisation. Okay, some things to consider when you're looking at survey data. Um, now, particularly for the health and wellbeing surveillance system, but this is often across a lot of surveys, unfortunately, the information collected is really not suitable for the culturally and linguistically diverse groups um, because most surveys are conducted in English and so you need a certain level of proficiency to be able to respond. Um, secondly, our sampling process doesn't really allow us to select respondents based on ethnicity. Um, so therefore, while Aboriginal people do complete the survey, um, they only make up about 2% of our sample. And, um, they actually really make up 3% of the population, so we're obviously getting an underrepresentation there. And if we look at some particular health regions, such as the Kimberley and the Pilbara, um, they're only making up 15% of our sample in those areas, um, whereas if we looked at census data for the ABS, it should be up more than 40%. So we won't ever provide Aboriginal data um, separately. 
Um, as I mentioned before, to show data for small geographic areas, sometimes we need to aggregate by year to get enough people in a particular area to show you. But we will always do our best to do that. Um, with all surveys, you need to be aware of the sampling frame and what inclusions and exclusions um, are applied because of that. So because our sampling frame is white pages, um, it's going to include some population groups such as prisoners and homeless. Um, and finally, the data is self-reported, um, so therefore it can be subject to recall bias. Um, it will also sometimes provide a different interpretation of an event than is shown through hospitalisation data. Um, so for example, before we looked at survey respondents who self-reported a fall, and then looked at how their hospitalisation was coded, um, it wasn't necessarily always coded at all. And there's some examples of that are when, um, for example, you've had a hip replacement and you've gone home, and you've tried to climb the stairs and perhaps you've fallen over, and you've gone back to hospital, that would be coded as an adverse event um, to a medical procedure. Whereas if you ask the person in the survey, they would say it was a fall. Um, so yeah, so sometimes you can just give a different interpretation of the same event. Okay, um, that's it for me. So hopefully that's illustrated how survey data can be used with some of the other data sources. Um, and I'll have, hand over to Grace and Shannon now to talk about the GIS and spatial data. <laughs> to see how data is related in space and time. So you may wonder, what is the special data? Um, there are two big groups of special data. One is the vector data, um, which is shown here. It's, um, the, they are points, um, lines, um, polygons. Points is like a hospital, a location. Lines is like a road um, or highways. Um, polygon is just like an area, a, um, a suburb or postcode area. Um, the, the other um, special data is um, raster data that um, typically like um, error photo images or um, topographic images. Um, this is all the special data we have within health department. Uh, um, we hold or we manage and maintain all our administration boundaries, um, all our health district. district the district region and the health service are defined using health geographic classification. Um, it's all based on ABS um, boundaries, so we can get accurate um, population data. We also have a hospital catchment area, mental health catchment area, uh, child and lesson community health boundaries as well. Um, we also have, we maintain all our health um, facilities, such as hospitals, um, charge adolescent community health facilities, um, some of the aged care facilities as well. Um, we, we, we update this on an annual basis. Um, and also we have the um, disease data when, if they have a location information phase. So uh, we also get lots of information from the other government agencies. Um, Landgate is our main um, data provider for the base um, special data, like um, all the like, uh, um, LDA boundaries, um, local, uh, um, locality boundaries, all the roads, um, property street address, um, cadastre, um, geonoma. <coughs> geonoma is just all the geographic name um, in WA. It has millions of records. Um, we have all the error images available in WA. Um, all, all this is available um, in our department. Um, we also have um, data from department planning for the town planning scheme um, and um, public transport, um, roads, stops, um, all that information we source from public transport authority. Um, we got our main roads data from main roads and um, we also have our Aboriginal community data from um, Aboriginal Affairs. 
um, we also have the other like um, press release or the other information from other government agencies. Um, I think um, I will talk a little bit more about the data from ABS. Um, Laura already mentioned um, some of them, and I will talk a little bit more in detail about that. Um, we mentioned about ABS geographic classification, but maybe you guys are not really um, aware. From 2011, ABS changed the, their geographic classifications um, to the new ABS statistic geographic standard. Um, so we won't be able to use specific local area anymore. We will use statistical areas. Um, they have um, four levels. Um, most of them, most of us will use SA2 level. The second level is the equivalent uh, to the statistical local area. Um, so all our boundaries have been adjusted um, to the SA2 boundaries. Um, yeah, I will talk a little bit about the CFA score and the area. So the concept and um, measurement of CFA is just that um, ABS defined that in terms of people's access to um, material and social resources and their ability to participate in society. That's that's the that's the concept they define the CFA. So for ABS published four index of CIFA um, every census year. So every geographic area in Australia is given a CIFA score, which shows how um, this atom, this advantage that area is compared with um, the rest of the area in Australia. So these are the four um, index ABS published in every census year. Um, the most popular one we use is the first one, the index of relative socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, this is the, the map showing the 2011 result. Um, the red area is the, the most disadvantaged. The green area is the least disadvantaged. Um, so the other, we, you, we, we have heard this morning mentioned quite a few times about area is the accessibility um, or remote, um, remoteness index of Australia. Um, Area classifies Australia into large areas, large regions that share the common characteristics of remoteness. Um, the remoteness was uh, derived from the travel distance from a locality to a service area. It's just that the, the distance, how, how far people have to travel for a service. Um, because Australia is huge, and um, especially in the West Australia, we have um, a large area and we don't have many population. Um, so this is quite more important for our planning our services. Um, area actually is developed by the <coughs> Australia Population and uh, Migration Research Centre and uh, University of Adelaide. And uh, it is widely used in Australia. And the ABS adopt their um, index. Um, so it's... Um, it's very, very well researched um, by that by that institute. So um, it's um, it's very good um, research. It's a very good index to measure the remoteness. Um, in here, it's um, this one is based on the SA2, I think. Um, so divide divide Australia into very remote, remote, and uh, inner regions and regions and uh, major cities. So Jenna will present some of the examples of our work. Thanks, Grace. So I've got just a few very simple injury examples that I thought might be good to have a look at today. So this ties in a little bit to what Grace was just showing about ARIA and remoteness. So this is looking at the average travel time between injury and first provider. And it's a not, it's just been calculated, we've calculated it ourselves, students and users, and this is just the way that sometimes when you see data and it's in a table, well, I make maps, so I think that's pretty. So I sometimes think that a map can really highlight what's actually happening, especially because our state is so, so huge and it's quite varied in what's happening. So you can really see here 
that there's some pockets that maybe have some probably more potential issues if people have injuries there. There's obviously a lot longer time for people in the big red colours that uh, will actually get a first provider or someone on, on hand for assistance. And here I've got another, it's pretty um, difficult to see that there's any variation there, but that's sometimes what the data shows you. So this is shown here, emergency department attendance due to injury, poisoning and toxic effects in Aboriginal males, and it's using rate comparisons. So before, uh, I think Peter and maybe Laura have mentioned a little bit about um, rate ratios and things like that. So this is comparing how an area, and I know someone asked about health regions and health districts, so we're using some health regions on here, some health geographical areas, and comparing how that region is going compared to the state. So the red areas, in terms of um, comparison of how people are attending emergency departments due to injury, the red areas are more people attending emergency compared to the state, and in the North Metro, South Metro and South West, less people compared to the state. So it just depends on what you're trying to look at, sometimes and that can be helpful. So this next one is injury-related deaths for non-Aboriginal people over 2001 to 2010. And I know before, I think Peter's mentioned that sometimes if you have some specific data that you want, we might have to aggregate it across years. So to make up numbers, sometimes it's better to have a look at nine, 10 years worth of data, then we might not be able to give it to you just for one year's worth of data. So this is just total people. And if I go to my next slide, it's the same thing, but it's just looking at males. So sometimes, if you're looking at a combined total of what's happening, it's quite a different picture to males and also to females. So females paint a very different picture to injury-related deaths compared to the combined or even the males. So it's really depending on what you're looking at especially going back to that example that Peter had earlier, if you're looking for you know, a strategy for the whole state and if you target it just at combined, you might end up getting quite a different picture if you drill down a little bit further and break it into the different sexes or maybe even age groups. So it's always worth thinking about what other data is there available and will that help me paint a different picture that might help you target the areas that you're interested in. So they were just a few examples. And this last one that I have here is another injury-related example. And it's looking at the number of drowning cases over 10 years because the numbers are too small. So as you can see in, I guess, the middle of Australia, sometimes there's just no data. Maybe there's no drownings occurring because they don't have as much access to water, things like that, maybe no pools in those areas. So Depending on what you want to see, sometimes looking at over a state can definitely show you what's happening, but tables also are really good to have a look at as well. So it's really a combination of what data sources help you and what data sources can help you to show what's happening in your area of interest. So I think we're passing over to... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's just the end of our data sources and epidemiology branch. But we are very fortunate to have a couple of speakers today from the um, data linkage branch. And the first one is uh, Jeff Davis. And he's going to talk to us about an overview of the um, data linkage work. So <coughs> to use this microphone or can you hear me if I just uh, speak with the microphone? Oh, okay. Alright, so I've been instructed to use the microphone. So good morning everyone, I'm Jeff Davis and I'm here to tell you about data linkage and just catch up in my notes here. So data linkage refers to a methodology for joining together bits of data for information, and say it could be information sort of coming from all sorts of 
sources, uh, but in our case we're interested in information uh, about people. And so, having said that, I'd like to start with an observation about the behaviour of people. And here's a, uh, a slide that has quite a few uh, various images on it. And so we'll just work through those a bit. Um, there's a number of images on there that look like some sort of computer game. And uh, I'm kind of hoping that, uh, that some of you may recognise what game this is. It's a game called Lemmings. Um, it's quite an old game. And these images are from the, the first version of that. I understand there's been a few iterations of this game. Anyway, so uh, this image uh, with the gold pillars in it, let's have a look at that. So the object of the game is that these uh, little creatures sort of drop into the, the level that we're playing. And um, you can see there's a, a hatch up in the sort of top left-hand corner there. So all the lemmings drop out of the hatch. They come into this, into this level. And the object is to get them to the exit and get them all back out of that level. The exit is this kind of little uh, thing over here. Um, there's another image up in that uh, corner there. And something to observe in that image is that there's, uh, there's a whole line of lemmings walking along and um, they're, they're getting through that sort of mesh somehow. I think uh, they're called bashes or miners or something. Um, so what the player does is modifies the lemmings behaviour and uh, so they'll, they'll just walk backwards and forwards but if you modify it they start bashing through this, this mesh and get to the exit so, uh, Alright, just to have a, have a break from lemmings for a moment, let's look at these images down the, down the bottom there. Uh, we've got some people on there, there's a line of people walking along a, a cliff face uh, everyone's following everyone else and uh, and there's an, another image <coughs> over here where we've got some some people. I think that's in in uh, China somewhere, um, where there's some some pretty specky bushwalks. If you could call it a bushwalk, and they're making their way along the ledge there. Everyone's following each other, and in the middle of that, there's someone's feet. It looks like they're about to step off the edge of a cliff, perhaps. Anyway, back to lemmings. So um, with lemmings. Check out this image in the middle here. Um, that, I just put that there to show you what happens to a lemming if you don't intervene in the lemming's behaviour. If you just let them go, and if they sort of drop down, they can drop down some distance and they're alright, but if they drop down a big distance, then they go splat on the ground and turn into lemming soup or something. And so, uh, so what happens is that the player intervenes and you can see that on the, on the gold pillars there um, that when the lemmings step off the edge, if, if the player intervenes, they can turn them into floaters. You can see one of the lemmings has an umbrella if you have particularly good eyes and so they float down and they don't turn into lemming soup after all. Uh, a few more images on there. There's a line of people, they seem to, just the very bottom corner a line of people are walking along the top of a cliff and they seem to actually be going over the edge of the, the cliff. So, uh, and, a, and a couple of feet in thongs down here that look like they're stepping off the, the edge of a cliff or I have done or something. So what I'm trying to do here is to show you by going backwards and forwards between the lemmings and the images of the people is that there seems to be some parallels, uh, similarities between human behaviour and lemming behaviour. And uh, and so you're kind of thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm going a little bit too far with this um, analogy because if, if there's a cliff over there and, uh, and I see someone sort of run and throw themselves off the cliff, uh, we're not about to sort of follow them over the edge of the cliff, are we? I'm not going to say, whoa, man, look, that dude just threw himself off the cliff. That's so cool. I'm going to do it too. It's just not going to happen. So, um, nevertheless. <laughs> well, maybe it will happen. Okay, so let's just agree for the purpose of this presentation that there's some similarities between uh, people 
and lemmings, and we're seeing some rather lemming-like behaviour in this image. So having observed that, what then can we learn from uh, observing the lemmingness of people? Well, in the game of lemmingness, sorry, in the game of lemmings, uh, they all follow each other around in a line, more or less, and we can see where they've been, where they are now, and where they're going to. And we can make a pretty good guess at what will happen to them if we don't intervene. Okay, so people are like lemmings, great, but we don't exactly have people conveniently located in a computer program. I guess if we did, it wouldn't be called lemmings, what would it be called? Peoples, perhaps? And we'd all be looking forward to the next, the next release of the lemmings game, uh, of the peoples game. Uh, so, right, moving on from that. Uh, I just want to... <laughs> I just want to switch to a, a, a slightly different concept and look at an example of um, road crashes. So, road crashes suck, right? And how much do they suck? Well, we can go and ask Epi because they're pretty good at measuring these sort of things. And, uh, and so Epi says, yeah, hang on, I'll just go and get my suckiness level uh, calculator. And they're going to calculate something. What are they calculating? Well, they might count up uh, numbers of hospitalizations. They might count up numbers of deaths associated with road crashes, or convert those into rates. And we can try and do something about it, and then maybe go back and measure those things again and see if those have any impact. Well, that's an encouragement, but maybe we can do a bit better. To do something, to intervene, we really need to know what led to the crash? What was the person's circumstances? What was their health like? What sort of vehicle were they in? What was the environment like? Did they have a history of uh, drug use, legitimate or otherwise? And if we want to know the real effect of the crash, uh, then we can, we can see that they might uh, end up in hospital. But what happens after that? Is there a sort of ongoing repercussions for uh, a longer time afterwards, uh, perhaps there's an effect on their job or their, their family. So it's easy to understand when we're thinking about lemmings, and I'm back to that again, um, when we're looking at lemmings we can sort of see them moving around the screen, where they've been, where they are, where they're going to, uh, and imagine if we could do something similar with people, if we were able to see where they had been, where they are, and where they're going to. Well, it turns out that we can, and it's possible through data linkage. So data linkage is a technique for creating links between pieces of information that are thought to relate to the same person, family, place, or event. And there's a, an image in the bottom of this slide, a, a chain. This is representing a person. And you've heard about some of these uh, uh, data sources already today. So this is showing that we can take bits of information uh, from all these different sources about a person and link them together so that we have their kind of life story in front of us. We start with uh, some information <coughs> about their birth and then we can move on to see when they start at school. Later on they become an elector uh, and we've got various sources of data in there. We've got some uh, trauma data, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, later this afternoon. Um, then they, uh, they get married at some point, and not surprisingly, that leads to mental illness and eventual <laughs> hospitalisation, and then they die. Um, so so this, this uh, uh, illustration is just one person, but the real power of linkage comes when we can do this for, for thousands of people or whole populations of people. Um, and so we can see where such populations have been and where, where they are, and if we continue to follow them through data linkage, then we can see what eventually becomes of them. This is just a, a very quick sort of overview of the sorts of information which has been linked. So, uh, and EPI has been using um, many of these sources of, of data, and indeed is responsible for collecting some of them. 
Um, and so linkage is all about just connecting the bits of information in those, uh, in those sources of data. So in the green box in the middle, we have uh, something that I've labeled core links there, and it contains information from the hospital system for mental health, emergency, the cancer reg, uh, midwives, there's um, some collections from the Registrar General's Office, the births, deaths and marriages, and there's also electoral data in there. And so what happens with this information is that all of the records are, are linked within the collection so that we can identify everything that pertains to one person uh, within a particular source of data. But there are also links made uh, across those collections as well, so that we can see uh, if someone uh, comes up in the hospital morgue system, uh, which of the records in emergency belong to that same person in the morgue system and so on. So it's all linked internally and, and across those collections. And, and you can think of that core as a sort of spine uh, of links. And everything else we link to that spine. So you can see there are other sources of data um, around that core, and I won't go through the whole lot, but just to point out a few uh, in the WA Health section here, you can see we've got uh, some Royal Perth Hospital Trauma Registry data, and I'm just highlighting that because you'll be hearing more about that later. Um, but also of interest, um, if you look under that other organisations section, um, there's the Insurance Commission data in there and there's main roads uh, of WA data and this might just might be useful for finding out something about certain types of trauma uh, and um, injury. So a little bit about uh, how links are actually made. Well cast your minds back to the late 80s, remember that. Um, and some of the more geeky types in here, if there are any, may recall a Scottish company going by the name of DMA, doesn't mean anything, in which a number of technicians were busily writing a program for the Amiga operating system. The program was a game, and the game was called Lemmings. <laughs> now bring your minds back to now, 2013. As we speak, there is an Australian organisation called Data Linkage, in which a number of technicians are busily putting together pieces of information about people's lives to create chains of information. The information can be used to play a game, we referred to it before, it's called peoples. <laughs> so how are these technicians putting together the pieces of people's lives, or the pieces of information about people's lives? How are these made? Well, here's uh, eight steps describing the process that we go through to link data. And I'll just read through these. We get the demographic data, we clean and standardise demographic data, we load uh, that data into demographic tables, we extract and link variables from the tables, we run the linkage engine using link variables, we load links in the links table, we update links as required, and we extract linkage keys from the links table. Oh, it's actually pretty involved. Um, of those eight steps that I've just uh, run through there, there's actually only one of them which is about doing the actual making the links. The rest of it is about how we handle the data and keep track of links that we've made, uh, how we keep track of that in such a way that we can keep on updating that. Uh, and I won't go, you'll be relieved to know, uh, through all of those eight steps, but I will just talk a little bit about what happens in step five, and that's where the actual links are made. So we use uh, probabilistic methods to compare like elements and calculate the likelihood that records <coughs> belong to the same entity. Uh, and it's an iterative process in which we find the easy links, we get the low hanging fruit, as it were, and then go back and look at what is not yet linked and so on. And once all the, the records are, um, are weighted, we set threshold weights to divide the, the possible links into three groupings, and that's sort of illustrated in this graph here. 
So in the graph there, there's a, a big hump, there's a little hump, and there's a couple of goalposts there. So the little hump, uh, that is to represent the distribution of uh, weights um, of true links. The big hump is representing the distribution of weights of false links, and the goalposts are the thresholds that we set. And so what we do is we say, anything on that side of the bar goalpost, we accept as an automatic link because it's got a, a pretty good uh, weight in the right place. Anything that's on my side of the goalpost on this side, we reject because it's got a low weight um, and we're pretty sure that that's not a link. Everything that fits in between the goalposts there, we need to have a closer look at and make some sort of decision about it uh, through a clerical review process. And just a couple of illustrations which hopefully will uh, make it clear what, what we're doing when we're linking records. So this, uh, all three of these examples are set up the same way. We see there's a number of attributes uh, down the side here. We've got a, a value for each attribute uh, and there's a weighting over uh, on the other side there. So this is comparing two records for um, someone whose name is Marilyn Brandis. And it, if what you, it kind of looks like there's uh, the name has been repeated twice. We've got Brandis, Brandis, Marilyn, Marilyn, Joan, Joan. That is because uh, we've got uh, the, the first line in each of those is one record, and the second line uh, is from the second record, so that's record number two. And it looks like it's probably a match because uh, everything's turning out to be the same. And you can see there's some weights over the side there. For Brandis, the weight was 17.3, exact match. Um, but if you look at uh, sex, so we've got 2.2, two. it's an exact match, but the weight is only 1.12. Why is that? Because uh, sex is very, um, or being a female, sorry, is, is a common thing. Um, so the fact that you have two records that are both female, well, you know, that's not really enough information to tell us that it's, it's a, a link or not. Whereas the surname, Brandis, is there anyone in here whose surname is Brandis? No. So it's not a very common name, right? So the fact that we have two records that have this uncommon name, we're thinking, well, this is, this is uh, some real information there. This could well be the same person. So we give them a higher weight on that. So we add up all these weights. Uh, we've got a total in there. Uh, and that is uh, uh, what we use to make a decision about whether to link or not. In this case, it is a link. Here's an example of a not link. Uh, and you can see there are differences there. The surname is different. We've got Gilbert and Smith, different, different surname. The first name is the same, Elizabeth uh, and Elizabeth. The second given name, it would have the same initial, but they're actually different names, Sarah and Susan, different dates of birth. Look at the weights down the other side there. We're getting given negative weights there. Um, and so the total weight down the bottom here, minus 14.81. Yeah, we can chuck this one out. That's not a link. One more example. Now, uh, in some cases, <laughs> um, where we can't quite make a decision. So if we have a look at what's going on in here, uh, when we run our, um, our linking software, we get our weights assigned. Um, so for the surname, 7.64 because brown is an exact match to brown. Um, in the given name, we've got Malcolm and William. They're two different names. So we've got a low weight there. In the given name too, we've got Bill and Malcolm. Again, two different names. They don't, uh, they don't connect up. But there's some other things that look like, well, it could be the same person. It's got the same address. They both live out at Department of Health. <laughs> um, and so we get this weight, and it's not really a great weight, 5.34, and we put that into our category of things that we need to go back and look at. So the linkage officer then uh, gets all of their clerical reviews, and they have a look at this, 
And um, this is where people are a little bit smarter than computers. So we can look at this, uh, and yeah, sure, the, the first name is, uh, is different in one record compared to the other record, and the same with the given names, but look closely at what is going on there. We've got Malcolm is given uh, in, in one, but Malcolm is also given in the other, it's this reversed order. And then William and Bill, well, Bill's a, a shortened term of, a, a shortened uh, version of William, right? So, as a linkage officer, I'm thinking, you know, I, I reckon there's a bit of a tangle up, sure, but I reckon that's basically the same names. Uh, we've got the same surname. Um, date of birth is pretty close, it's exactly one year out there. So, uh, you know, maybe uh, I was feeling a little bit self-conscious about getting old if you started that report one year younger. Um, so as a, as a linkage officer, I'd probably say, having clerically reviewed that, let's accept that. So uh, this is um, in that linkage, we run our own servers and they're housed away in a, in a uh, secure area. And this is our systems development team inspecting some of our gear in there. And so by this stage, the astute listener should be wondering about security and ethical issues of doing all this. <laughs> If data from so many sources and for everyone in WA can be used in research projects, that means all kinds of people could be poking around in our personal information, right? Well, my personal information is in there and has been used in various projects, so why am I not alarmed about this? I hate to tell you I'm not alarmed, right? <laughs> so it turns out we haven't just taken a reckless leap of faith with this data. I'll describe the strategies employed uh, which can allow you to breathe easy. Incidentally, don't follow this bloke's example and go leaping off uh, cliffs like this. You could end up spending the rest of your life in a wheelchair. <coughs> but, uh, it seem that that's not enough to um, deter some people. Now, uh, what is coming up in the rest of my presentation uh, is a discussion about features of the way that we operate uh, to explain um, how we protect, protect data. But I'm sort of vaguely aware that we didn't have a lot of time, so I want to check there. Should I? I've got maybe 10 minutes to go. Can I continue? Five minutes? All right, I'll run through a little bit of this. Um, and if we need to stop, just, uh, just stop and then it's okay. So anyway, on to the story. So a number of strategies are employed to protect personal information. Uh, physical security, and uh, you can see in the image here, uh, that we have to swipe to get into the secure floor that we're located on in the Department of Health. And so everyone has to sort of swipe around the place, but other people in health can't get into our floor if we like to try and uh, stop Eddie getting, getting in there. <laughs> and, um, so we have physical security of the floor, our servers that we saw in the previous image are in a restricted area, and they're fully backed up to a secure off-site storage facility. Uh, and, oh yeah, and uh, when, so when uh, people come onto the floor, their movements are, are logged as well. So Link is handling the demographic data in a separate walled off area. Um, and one first has to get into the oh yeah, with the server and one first has to get into the secure floor before being able to proceed into the server room. And yeah, so, so physical security. We also have uh, various um, system features such as uh, um, links passed onto the <coughs> researchers are encrypted using project specific encryption. Uh, and so that can't be merged to other people's projects. And not all of the links in the tables area which the linkers are using are available to all linkers. They just have access to the particular records that they need to see to do their bit of the, the linkage. The data is also only available to authorised researchers with eth ethically approved projects. 
Uh, and I may have a moment to tell you a little bit more about that in the tech. I'm just sort of pulling the eyes out of this as we go. Um, so what I want to tell you about though is a separation principle. Now this is a concept that guides how we operate, our organisational structure, our physical location and our expectations of people wishing to use linked data. The separation principle is an approach to minimising exposure of potentially identifying information. And it's an, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's an approach to minimising the potential for a misuse in the event that uh, an identity is recognised. So if we just have a look at this slide, uh, I've tried to point out that there are two distinct phases that we separate everything into. One is the linkage process, which uses identifiable information, and it's the names and addresses of things that we saw in those examples uh, that the linker is looking at. Um, but uh, people doing the linkage do not have access to the clinical or service data. So they know who someone is, but they don't know what has happened to that person. On the other hand, uh, the other bit of the process, we've got uh, analysis of data. And so if people are analysing the data, they look at the clinical data, they don't get to see any identifiers, they don't know all about what has happened to people, but they don't know who those people are. And so we take this concept and we incorporate it into our whole business uh, practice. I'm just going to skip over that. Let's just really sort of reiterating a bit what I've already said. Um, so the application process, uh, I'll move on to, on to that. Do I move on to that? Uh, now I'll tell you about the extraction process instead. Um, because uh, this sort of illustrates a little bit about how we how we use the, the separation principle. So, um, so once we've uh, we've got all of the links in our in our linkage table, we want to be able to actually use those. So, we're ready to pull some of those out for a particular project. And uh, well, I'm getting I'm getting a, uh, the sign here that I need to wrap this up. So we pull the links out for a particular project um, and we pass those on to the custodians. So we might, I don't know, we've, we've got a, a cohort, we want to we look at anyone who's had a, a road crash in the last year, so we pull out the links of anyone who fits into that category. Pass those on to the custodians that we want to get some service information from. So in here I've got represented trauma data, hospital data and death data. Those custodians give us the records that belong to those particular links uh, and we pass those records on to a uh, linkage uh, analyst who just checks that we've got the information that is relevant to the project and then we pass all of those records on to the researcher. So notice that uh, in this model that we've got represented here that the researcher never came into contact with any identifying information. They're just looking at the records relevant to their project, um, uh, which uh, explain what has happened to the people in that group. The analyst didn't see any names uh, and addresses or identifying information. Uh, we have to go right back to the actual custodians where they potentially have access to it, but they wouldn't generally be accessing uh, identifiers um, just to pull out those records that are linked to you. Um, and I'm going to stop there. So I'll just go straight to the most important slide. <laughs> Does anyone uh, have any questions uh, for me? I wanted to explain some of this concept. Did you understand any of it? <laughs> Because if there's one take home message is to know that we are like lemmings. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks Jeff for that uh, very entertaining and uh, interesting um, presentation. I think it demonstrates the complexity and also the elegance of the data linkage uh, process. Um, later this afternoon we've got Di Rosman who's the manager. That's a yeah, program, program manager. Program manager data linkage. To talk about an application using data linkage. So if you have a few Formulate some questions over lunch. You've got an opportunity to 
ask um, Diane questions about that link. You can as well. So now we uh, we'll go to lunch. Thank you. Welcome back from lunch. Um, I just thought we could be sort of rush through the last uh, bit a little bit. Um, I wanted to give uh, you the opportunity to ask if any questions about the data sources are. Uh, quickly for five minutes, can we, uh, can we clarify anything for anybody about the data sources that we talked about? If there are any questions, if there are not, we'll move on. So anything about our data set, uh, survey, GIS mapping, spatial analysis, all happy? Okay, well the, the, um, the afternoon session is, is all about um, interpretation of data, so we're um, going to hear about our um, health effects application and use that to demonstrate epidemiological measures that we can provide you to use in your work, and then we're going to give you some um, data from our exercise for you to interpret and see if you can understand um, the types of things that we've been providing for you. So uh, we've got Alex uh, Dow to talk to us about um, our health tax application and interpretation of data. Thank you, Peter. Can you help me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the presentation and the interpretation of epidemiologic measures. And uh, of course, firstly, I will introduce a main online application, online reporting uh, application to you. So basically, this online uh, application is called Health Tracks Reporting Application. It is a health department intranet online application. Currently, it is available to anybody working within the public health system. <clears throat> if you are working outside of the public health system, you can still uh, and, uh, ask or request data from us, and we can extract information from this application and send it to you. So basically, uh, once you once you get into the system, and then you can enter uh, your uh, normal HE number. Yeah. Once you enter your HP number and the, and then you enter your password, this password can be different from your normal password. So sometimes we uh, uh, we get a phone call from people to say, oh, I forgot my password. That's fine. Send an email to us to uh, epi at health.wa.gov.au, and then we will uh, sort that for you. So you can uh, regain your access. <coughs> And if you are a first-time uh, user, you have to uh, uh, register. Basically, the registration process is very simple. Just provide us uh, your name, uh, where you work, and uh, your contact details. And then immediately, within seconds, you'll get full access to this tool. So once you get into the system, and then uh, you will see, uh, you can select report. As you can see on the screen, you can see, you can uh, uh, get reports on general health profile. Basically, it is a uh, profile describing the population in a certain area, and the, the latest census information for the population and also the information from survey group, mainly risk factors and the disease preference information. And then subsequently, you will display the information on hospitalization and the mortality data. <coughs> Some other reports include health topic overview, health condition overview, so both of them just show you uh, what happened 
uh, if you check the major categories, uh, major, major categories, like um, uh, if you are interested in circulatory disease, it will show you all the uh, circulatory categories and rank them to, say, to show you which one is the most important condition in your area, <coughs> and, and then show you some other happy measures. I'm going to show you later on. And of course, uh, the leading health condition report will show you top 15 conditions will ranked uh, in descending order and show you what is the most important uh, condition in your area, what is the least important condition in your area. The specific health condition analysis report will give you chance to drill down. For example, if you, if you want to know the uh, injury, of course, we, 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 can say, we can show you the transport injury, and then you, if you want to drill down to say, tell me whether it's to do with pedestrian or is to do with motor, motor vehicle accidents, so we can show you the nitty-gritty details through special, specific health condition analysis report. And also, we can show you uh, the operational and the non-original comparison report, and then tell you what is the rate for original population, what is the rate for non-original population, and then you can immediately <coughs> say what, what are the differences between these two population. <coughs> the next one, I will show you the area comparison. Uh, later, I'll show you what sort of geographic area you can uh, we, we, you can get a report on. So one, once you select a report, and then you specify other parameters, and then uh, you can check the report. So you can see on the middle of the screen, you can say you can click view report, and immediately the report will be uh, displayed. And also, if you need a help, here you can say, uh, if you click that icon, it will, it will display a user menu, user guide, to say, uh, guide you how to use this tool. And also, we have a, if you click here, it will give you an audio video demonstration and show you the step-by-step -step guide and how to interpret the data within the system as well. Very handy. Once you uh, select a report, and the next step, you select a uh, data set. I highlight, I highlight here 11 data sets that are related to injury and the poisoning statistics and the FP measures. So basically, they are death by conditions, avoidable deaths between 0 to 70, uh, 74 uh, four years, Hospitalizations by condition, hospitalizations by major diagnostic category and the diagnostic related groups, and the hospitalization by external causes for all uh, for all external causes, hospitalization by external causes, that is the injury and the poisoning related. The difference between the uh, <coughs> Hospital, hospitalization by external causes or and the hospitalization by external causes, injury and the poisoning is the first one will show you everything as long as you have a external external causes in your record, you'll be included. However, the second one only sh only show only show you if you in your record if your principal diagnosis is injury and the poisoning, you will be included. So in that sense, the first report will show uh, bigger number than the second one in most cases. The next one is potentially preventable hospitalization, and the next one is hospital uh, uh, drug and alcohol related deaths, drug and alcohol related hospitalizations. Also, we can show you ED attendances, ED attendances by triad categories. As you know, the triad category, we all together we have five uh, triad categories dependent upon emergency or uh, uh, 
uh, basically the heart actually the heart rate one is you have to treat the patient immediately, otherwise the patient will die. And the category part is sort of uh, you go to the ED department just for a prescription or a brief consultation. It's not <coughs> life threatening at all. Yeah, so basically there are five categories. We can show you data break it down in such manner as well. This table gives you a little bit more details. So this one shows you injury and poisoning related data sets and their contents in health track reporting. As I mentioned before, the deaths mainly uh, show you injury and the poisoning and the talk about the causes, for example, uh, whether the death was caused by suicide or caused by traffic accidents, etc. etc. The hospitalization by condition will show you injury and the poisoning to your parts of the body. For example, the injury occur to your head or to your arm, to your, to your leg, or which part of the body has been injured. The hospitalization uh, by MDC and the DRG basically just show you the injury and the poisoning uh, and the toxic effect of drugs. It's, it's mainly for uh, resource allocation <coughs> purpose. The hospitalization by internal causes all will show you detailed breakdown of the injury and the poisoning for all the causes. And the next one show you uh, only those people with principal diagnosis of injury and the poisoning. And I'll show you a detailed breakdown of those nitty gritty injury and the poisoning types. Drug and alcohol related deaths and uh, uh, drug and alcohol related hospitalizations will sh show only show you the following categories, which include false broad injury, suicide, assault, and other injuries. Basically, these five types. ED attendances only show you as one single category, which is injury, poisoning, and the toxic effects of drugs. Simply because the ED data is uh, relatively is not so uh, complete, uh, complete compared to hospital mobility or mortality data. Especially the data, ED data from rural area, it doesn't include diagnostic information, they are only categorized into uh, 22 categories. One of the categories is injury, poisoning, and the toxic effects of drugs. So if you want to know, oh, can you show me in the ED data how many people had, had injury? Sorry, we don't have such information. And also if you want to ask, uh, tell you how many people uh, committed suicide, again, we don't have enough information to tell you. Yeah. This table shows you uh, injury and the poisoning related part in hospitalization by condition data set. So here, I got three columns. The first column recorded major category. The second column recorded minor category. So I didn't put the third column is ICD-10 AM cause. So here you can say, if there is injury and poisoning, we can further uh, break it down into different types of injury and poisoning. You can say, uh, is, if it is in, uh, we talk about hospitalization data, we, for minor categories, the first minor category is injuries to head and then neck. That's the ICD-10 cause, that's a branch from S. 0, 0 to S19. The second one is injuries to uh, uh, to different uh, back, spinal, and uh, pelvis. So that's the ICD can cause range. So you can say mainly is to do is to which part of the body can be injured. Yeah, of course, there are some other others like um, complications of medical and the surgical care. So I will talk about a little bit more. So this one is to do with hospitalization data. Next one 
uh, is injury and forging related part in the mortality data, the death by causes deficit. Again, the major category we talk about is injury and poisoning, and you can see that the cause, causes of deaths break it up in such manner. So the first one is transport accidents, transport, accidental drowning, etc. etc. Okay. Again, you can see the ICD 10 codes we use here. Just now I mentioned ICD 10 AM, which is our Australian modification. But to do with mortality, we, we are using WHO ICD-10 codes. <coughs> this one shows you detailed information, which is the major categories and the associated external causes, uh, ICD-10 AM codes. So you can see altogether there are 23 major categories. And this one uh, gives you a further breakdown from major category to minor category. For example, if we talk about the transport accidents, and you can you can ask, oh, tell me, out of those people, how many people get a pedestrian injured in the transport accident, and how many people uh, was involved in the motor vehicle uh, or a motorcycle accident? So I can provide such detailed information to you. Once you select data sets and select major categories, and you, you, we can select some others. For example, you can select different geographic areas. Like the first one is area uh, health service. We have three uh, area health service, North Metro, South Metro, and the WEX. And then we can provide the information at the chart and uh, the license uh, health region. <coughs> Health district, health region, break down by metro and the country, or break down into metro, rural, and remote. We can provide the whole picture for the state. And also, we can drill down to statistical local area by area, by SEVA, by local government area, by Medicare local regions as well. And, and, and then once you select an area, you can select a particular age range. Here, I just select minimum age is 60, maximum is 84, uh, 85. Of course, you say, oh, I'm only interested in uh, kids, young kids, so you can select, change that one to zero, that one to four. So therefore, once you click here, you will pre produce a report, only uh, those information in relation to zero and four years of age. Once you select, uh, you specify the age and the family, you specify the originality, we can produce report by Aboriginal population only, non-Aboriginal population only, or we can produce a Aboriginal and Aboriginal combined report. Yeah. Once you specify all the indicators and the parameters, and you click new report, the report will, will be displayed. I, I thought we, we would send you the handout. Uh, within the handout, there are uh, two reports, but unfortunately, it is not available at the moment. <coughs> yeah, that's what I mean. So once you specify all the parameters and then click new report, you will get the report. Next, I'm going to show you briefly uh, how we are going to interpret the uh, graphs, tables, and the FD metrics from uh, from the uh, health track reporting to and from other sources, information we provide to you. So the, this one show you age specific accidental force hospitalization rates. So, so basically, this is the rate uh, which is called age specific rate per 1,000 person years, and Peter mentioned the concept <coughs> of person years. And here you can see that's the age group. So normally we provide you a five-year age group, so from zero to four, five to nine, up to eight plus plus. And then from this table, if uh, from this graph, you can see the the difference between males and the females actually is relatively small. You know, with all age groups, they are very very close. 
only after that point, the females that are practically higher weight than males. <coughs> this one shows you age-specific transport accidents, just causation rates. So you can see that totally different picture. And again, you can see overall males that are higher weights than females, right? And for, for both males and females, you can see two spikes. One is here, another one is, is over there. So that means between age, probably I would say between 10 to 14 to roughly 30 to 34, there's one peak for both male and female. And after 70 or 34, the rates going up. So next, I, I, I'm talking about the difference between crew rates and the age standardized rate. So the first picture show you the crew rate. Basically, as Peter mentioned, crew rate simply is the number of hospitalization divided by the total population within a year, right? So you can see there is a sort of difference between males and the females, right? Females got a rapidly higher rates than males. However, once we apply age standardization, you can see the difference between male and female actually becomes smaller. It's not that big. Simply because once we apply the standardization, we apply the age specific rates of a population to Australia 2001 standard population for both male and female, and we are using the Australian standard population as a golden standard, and then at that moment, male and female are sort of comparable. Here, it's not so comparable. So therefore, when we provide the information to you, always we provide ASR, age standardized rates to you. And also, on top of this, because is, we got the yearly data, normally we provide you a trend analysis, and we use Poisson regression to examine the trend of change in rates. In this case, the, the change in ASR over years, there are three types of trend. Significantly increasing trend, you are going up. Significantly decreasing trend, we are going down dramatically. And after something in the middle, for example, whether it's quite a stable a change over time or there's a fluctuation over time, so basically three types. And if it's a significant trend, it will have a p value less than 0.05. And also, we provide you with an average annual percentage change uh, as well. Next, I'm, I'm talking about a very important concept for the data we provide to you, which is standardized rate ratio. And as Peter mentioned, standardized rate ratio is the ratio of observed events, for example, number of hospitalizations, divided by expected number of hospitalizations. <coughs> so in, in this graph, basically, it shows you Compared to the state, uh, state rate among males, country rating residents, whether it's a significantly higher than state rate, lower than the state rate, or similar to the state rate, we, we use three colors. If it's red color, so that means this condition is significantly the rate for this condition is significantly higher than the state rate. If it's blue color, that means the rate for this condition among male is significantly lower than the state. Otherwise, if it's gray, this one, this one, and that one, that means the rate for this area in the country area is similar to the state. So you can say which one is even higher, which one is even lower. So therefore, you are able to identify 
the most important condition you have to address in your uh, intervention program or in your planning. And also, another, uh, another important one, I, you have to say there's a line there, which is different to a value of one. Here, not only we provide a standardized variation in this case, it's to do with supplementary factors related to cause of morbidity and mortality classified as well. For this condition, not only we provide a SRR, which is standardized uh, rate ratio value, which is a point estimate, but also we give you a range estimate. So that means with a 95% confidence, the standardized rate ratio in relation to this condition compared to uh, a country, compared to the state, were falling between this point to that point. So roughly, we're falling between 1.5 to uh, 7. <coughs> in another word, this in country area for this condition, the rate is roughly 3.5 times higher than the state rate. Within the range, the range will start from 1.5 times to nearly 6. 0.5 times higher than the state rate. Very important point estimation and also branch estimation. If you sort of confident. Yeah. This one is for female. Definitely you can see a different picture. From here, there's no blue color. So therefore, all the conditions, the base are not uh, not significantly lower than state. Yeah? So, and also, all the red one will be significantly higher than the state. Rate. <coughs> this one, uh, this table gives you uh, a little bit further information, just how we display as a picture, and this one gives you even with the numbers. Right? So, you can say the that's the conditions, and this one gives you the number of <coughs> hospitalizations due to injury, and that's the SR, that's the point estimate I'm talking about. Standard of the rate ratio, that's the range, 95% confidence interval. So therefore, you can see the first one, because the confidence interval is uh, 1.49 to 1.55, so therefore, it doesn't contain one, a value of one, because in this case, state rate is a reference point. We treat state rate as one. If this range doesn't contain one, so that means the rate for that condition in country area is significantly higher than the state. Give you another example. This one contains one, so therefore, we say for this condition in the country area, actually, is similar to the state. If you have another example, this one, for this condition, the range is between 0.85 to 0.99, <coughs> so definitely doesn't include one, which is lower than one. The high limit is lower than one, so therefore, for this condition, the rate in the countryside is significantly lower than the state rate. This one, just to try to show you the number and the rate of accidental for hospitalizations in the state. The main point I want to show you is the comparison between male and the female. If we talk about the same year, 2007 compared to 2007, the rate, that's the number, and of course, you see the number for male is actually lower than female. The age standardized rate is lower than female as well. Right here, show you 95% confidence interval. For 2007, the uh, uh, interval from 487.7 to 5.15.84. For female, the range is 508 to 535. So you can see this these two ranges. Are they the overlap? Are they overlapping? Just. Just. 
If they are overlapping, so that means there's no significant difference. Yeah. If they are if they are not overlapping, so there is a significant difference. That's the use of 95% company in the world in this case. So therefore, overall, there's no significant difference between male and female for all years. Next one, I show you the number of accidental force hospitalization by originality and the gender. So this one just to show you numbers. As you can see, we got a bigger, much bigger population, not original population, the original population, original population is only about three percent of the whole uh, state population. So definitely, if you check the numbers, definitely this number is very, very small. So the numbers is important to give you the uh, magnitude of the problem, of the issue. So definitely. They, there's a difference between male and female, and also between original and non-original. The number is important, but most important one is the race. We always talk about the race in the raising, not just numbers. So this one show you percentage of external for hospitalization by age and gender. Just show you the age distribution between male and female, as you can see. For female, the, this proportion is the biggest. So mainly, the accidental force occur among female, mainly occur uh, for those old people. However, for male, mainly, the, it's, although it's still, the proportion is still big, but it's sort of evenly distributed among different people. And lastly, I want to show you some uh, maps. So the first one is the number of hospitalization due to injury by health district. So this is a map for insert. This is the map for OW. As you can see, that's the metro area. So you can see the red one is the highest number. The dark green is the lowest number. We talk about numbers, therefore, of course, the population, most of the population live here, of course, in terms of numbers, definitely we will see the red color, right? That's the numbers. However, if you check age standardized rate uh, for hospitalization due to injury, again by health district, you see totally different picture, right? So therefore, you can see in the uh, remote area, and in the rural area, you see red color. That, that's, the where, that's the area with a very, very high rate compared to metro area. In the metro area, majority of the health districts over there got a very, very low rate. Yeah. So always, I always emphasize, not only check numbers, but most importantly, check rates. Because race is a matter uh, which indicates the severity of the problem or the impact of the, of the issue. And also, definitely you can use race to identify population at the risk. So this one, this matter is much better than the numbers. Finally, I show you the standardized rate ratio of hospitalization due to injury in health district. Again, what I'm comparing here is compare the hospitalization in different health health district to the state rate, right? So this one show you. I class, we can classify them into three categories. The first category, the pink color, means the rate in a particular health district is significantly higher than the state rate. The yellowish color means you are similar to the, sorry, lower than the state, and the green color, green sign, means you are okay, you are similar to the state. So therefore, you can say, majority of the area in WA actually is actually in the remote and the rural area, 
the rates are higher in the stage. However, in the metro area, if you the lower than the stage, there are only one or two uh, health districts that are actually similar to the state. So that's sort of a comparison uh, we want to show you. So the K is always focused on the rate, and the always use eight standardized rate for comparison. Also, if you want to compare this to, to the stage, always use standard, uh, SRR, which is standardized mortality ratio.
um, quite flexible with keywords and form description in terms of whatever your particular question is. Um, one drawback though is there, it is a limited uh, population. It's not an injury surveillance tool. We don't capture everybody that has an injury. We capture um, patients who come meet the criteria, admission criteria for our registry, which I'll, I'll go into shortly. So we're not an administrative data set. We don't collect everybody. Um, Um, just so I touched on, so we're actually a trauma state trauma registry database, not a state trauma registry. And what I mean by that is we have five um, individual trauma registries who contribute to a single database, but they're still separate entities, and I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Okay, so the five registries, this is how we've got, we, we talk in terms of major and minor traumas, so um, I'll, again I'll explain that in a little while. So the hospitals that contribute to the state trauma registry database at the moment are all Hope Hospital, Princess Margaret Hospital, Fremantle, Jujima, and St Charles Garden. And as you can see, they came along at varying different stages. Um, all Hope started off in August 94. Um, PMH and Fremantle and Charlie's came along um, a little while after that, and Jujima more recently. Um, also, if you can just notice that we don't, not all the hospitals collect minors. Um, the other dis issue is that we previously, until um, January 2011, we all worked out of separate databases. So we had a Microsoft Access database at each hospital. We all collected the same data, um, the same data collection principles, but we were all separate. So in 2011, we all combined into the single um, database that we now call the State Trauma Registry Database. So it's an SQL database. Um, it's web-based, which means we have multi-site access. So those are the registries that we talked about at the moment that are contributing. The little um, red dial in at the bottom, just to show the flexibility of the database, we can add sites on um, as we go, as we, as we develop further. And what we're looking at at the moment is capturing data from the subset of patients who have their traumas up in the Kimberley who may get transferred to Darwin, um, as opposed to coming down to Perth. Um, so we feel that we need to have some information on those patients because they're still WA patients after all and we think that they should be captured in our data set. So we're currently going through a process of adding those, those patients to our database. So who collects the data? So we have dedicated level two nurses mostly um, and one research officer. So they're all trained um, various clinical backgrounds which are relevant to trauma as you can see. So intensive care, ED, burns, trauma. We have one, one nurse who's a clinical trials expert, so she's quite handy for writing proposals, and the health science graduate. So all these staff are trained centrally, wherever possible. Um, we have a uniform um, manual that we all work out of, and we're all trained in abbreviated injury scale scoring, which I'll talk about shortly. So it's a mandatory training. Um, it's an internationally accredited score. This is how we score our injuries, um, and we have to be renewed every three years. So what do we collect? As I said, it's a limited um, population, it's a targeted population, so it's patients who have a significant injury, they have to be admitted to hospital for more than 24 hours, they have to have had their trauma within the last seven days, so the reason being we, we feel as, as monitoring a service that we can't really make a lot of difference to a patient's outcome if we haven't had them, if they had their trauma three weeks ago, nothing we do is going to make much difference, so that's our cut off. Um, so as I said, more than 24 hours, apart from patients that die, so a patient who reaches hospital and dies in the ED, uh, we will collect those regardless of length of stay. So we don't collect all present presentations to the emergency department. So if they don't get admitted, or if they get, get admitted and go home less than 24 hours, we don't collect them except for death. We don't collect deaths that happen at the scene of trauma. So patients who don't get to hospital, we don't collect. And we don't collect patients who don't come to the Perth Registry Hospital. So what do we collect? So what is a trauma? So trauma is defined as an injury or a wound resulting from an external cause. So there's two components there. So you have to have a mechanism, you have to have a cause of trauma, and you have to have an injury to become a trauma patient on the database. So I'll just put a couple of scenarios up there, so just to clarify that. So a patient having a motor vehicle accident and has a fractured femur, a ruptured spleen, that's quite straightforward, he's had a mechanism, and 
major and minor trauma. So what we mean there is patients who have got an ISS, which I'll talk about, greater than 15. So that's a major trauma. So injury severity score greater than 15. So for these patients, we collect an extensive data set. So everything that happens from, from the time of injury right through to discharge, death, rehab, wherever they may end up. So we, we collect a whole range of data on those. For the minor trauma admissions, we only collect a limited data set. So how do we calculate an injury severity score? <coughs> so we have a abbreviated injury scale, which is an inju in individual injury code that we apply to each individual injury. And there's a score assigned to that. So from one to six, um, with one being the least serious, minor, through to six, which is usually a fatal injury. So anyone who gets, so we have that score, and the, the injury severity is Let's describe as the sum of the squares of the highest AIS code in each of the three most severely injured regions. So if I just explain that a little bit better. Um, we have body regions, one to six. And then in order to calculate an injury severity score, we take the worst injury score. So in this case, we've got a grade four liver laceration and the score is four. So if we square that score, we get a 16. Um, the face of skull fracture, in this case, the injury score is three. And for that injury, we get a nine. And for the lung contusions, we get a four. Now they're from three separate body regions, so we can count all of those, and we get a total of 41. So this patient's a critical patient. So just going back to the registry, uh, we're aligned to the WA Health um, data quality policy, so it means that we comply with these quality domains, and the way we do that is um, quarterly, regular quarterly and ad hoc data quality checks. So that's done, we've now just appointed a data manager for the state trauma registry database, and we're able to run all those QI um, checks centrally, so um, that's um, a really good, because previously we only had control over all credits. So we use the data for everything and anything, so um, obviously from an injury prevention point of view it's really useful to know what, what you know, we, we, the clinical staff who are collecting the data can notice trends straight away, they, you know, we're getting a spike, usually going back October, November time we suddenly find all these you know, Irish tourists diving into shallow water and getting dumped in Scarlet Beach, all that sort of thing, so it's quite useful to um, have an immediate feel for what's going on and, and try and arrange some kind of alert. So our, we're quite limited to what we can do at all but we usually manage to get some kind of media statement out with Dr. Brown or something like that. Um, and obviously there's the usual accreditation audits and benchmarking that we can do with that. Um, so we're all under this research governance policy. So um, you know, WA Health recognises that the data is there to be used and needs to be used to um, improve practice and outcomes of patients. Um, but it is, a, it is a policy that we all have to abide by. So um, whether you're a WA Health employee or a non-WA Health employee, so you may be coming from a university or um, a doctor in a hospital, but whatever, whatever your background and whatever you want to use the data for, there is a, there is a government process around that. So it's usually a two-pronged um, process, so you need to have your ethical and scientific review by a, a recognised um, health research um, ethics committee, and there's a WA Health governance um, review as well. So. I've just put it here, access processes. Um, there's a, a few different directions that you might have to go through depending on where you're coming from in, in order to access the data. Um, but just to highlight, you know, there is that governance review that um, looks at the appropriateness of your request in terms of the organisation that you're requesting from. And then the health 
the ethics application, um, which um, again is a few different um, processes that you may have to go through. As a data custodian, I'm not really too worried about what process you've gone through. All I want is the letter at the end from the Director General and or, or the um, maybe Royal Perth Hospital Executive Director, whoever um, um, has agreed through the governance process that you can access the data. So we get that letter. Um, what we want from you is for you to um, complete our very simple data request form, which is nothing like the ethics process that you have to go through. And what that does is initiate a discussion with us to help us to better meet, help you to um, determine what, how we can best help you get your data. So just a very simple, so very simple, just outlining your study, um, and then we can look at the data fields and discuss with you what's the best way. And it may be that we can't give you the data that you want, but we may be able to advise you as to where to go for that particular data element. And then we just have a data release contract as well. It's all part of the same form. And that just assures us that you're going to use the data for what you said you're going to use it for, that you're going to look after the data um, responsibly and, and destroy it um, uh, responsibly when you finish. And those, that form is available on our state system, uh, trauma system and services website. And So that's just a bit about the governance review. So basically, we just want to know, as data custodians, that, yeah, so we're going to review your data application and make sure that we can actually give you the data that you need, and it's an appropriate request. And the actual data steward will be the um, trauma director from the individual hospital, um, who, and their <coughs> relevant trauma committees will decide whether they to actually release the data. So that's just a bit there that talks about the, the role. So the Director General is generally the, the over, oversight for um, huge data collections such as data linkage projects. Um, data stewards are the ones that actually um, can authorise the release of the data and the data custodians are responsible for the actual development, development and data collection and maintenance and making sure everything is done properly and, and according to standards. So the reason we're so iffy about all of this is um, our patients don't give consent. They do not give individual consent to participate in your study. So patients who turn up to public hospitals, are, it's implicit consent. They're on the system and we get our data from the system. Um, so they're not going to sign a consent form for your study. So we have a duty of care to make sure that we disclose that data that we collected on them very responsibly and make sure everything So this is just a few data elements that we do collect. So the, the um, elements in red are the more detailed elements that we collect for our major traumas. So we have um, obviously all the demographics and, um, around the individual patients and a little bit more about some uh, past medical history comorbidities, um, you know, alcohol and drinking habits. Um, the actual trauma detail, so we've, we've got a, a lot more detail for everybody on the actual um, incident. We can talk about the pre-hospital phase, so how they got here, how long they spent at each hospital, and what actually happened at, at the um, pre So it may be a, with the ambulance, it may be an IRS provider, it may be a, a country hospital. So we can, and for our uh, major traumas, we can put in all that um, physiological and um, clinical data. When they get to the uh, definitive hospital, so by that I mean the actual registry hospital that that patient has ended up at, so their database, um, we can talk about what happens there in terms of this, the, the patient's condition on arrival and what measures we took in that sort of first few hours while they were in the emergency department. And then we've got a few more um, clinical information that we collect for the first 24 hours of their hospital admission, so um, all of this is up to that phase for major traumas and operations and complications um, right through to discharge. Um, for all traumas we obviously collect their discharge type, so where they, where they went to from either state rehab, home, death or hospital transfer. We don't collect, we don't follow patients up post-discharge. Post 
Of course, we give you the injuries. So we have an injury description, which is as detailed as we can make it, so that um, it's, it's usually it's, that's used for validation purposes as well against our schools, our only finished schools. So we have an in individual abbreviated injury scale score against each injury, so that's how we get the severity of injury for each one. Then we calculate the injury severity score, as I usually confused you about. <laughs> We've got a new injury severity score as well, which um, is just another way of um, different types of um, ISS, which I won't go into now. Um, for our major traumas, we can give you a physiological score, on, and that can be done at the time of injury, as well as um, their status on arrival to the Divinity Hospital, so you can see if there's been any change in their physiological condition, and out of that we can calculate a score, which is our TIS analysis, which is our trauma and injury survival, injury severity score, which um, gives us a probability of survival. That, that can be done at the time of injury and on arrival. So again, you can see if they've deteriorated or improved um, on route, which is quite important for a lot of our trauma patients coming from country regional areas can take up to 12, 13 hours more sometimes to get here. So it's quite important to see if there's been any change in their condition. Just some quick samples of data that we, this is the sort of stuff we put in our annual report. So demographics, simple demographics that shows where we can target our um, injury prevention strategies, such as parties. So for this one, you can see that 15 to 24-year-old males are a big, big problem for us. <laughs> um, cause of trauma, so um, I'm not sure how clear that is on there, but um, if you look at, we've got motor vehicle accidents, motor bike accidents, pedestrians, pedal cyclists, and pretty much makes up half of that pie chart. So road trauma is a significant issue as well. And falls is the second most common category for our major trauma injuries. We can talk about um, safety devices in this graph, which is um, mentioning seatbelt use. So this actually looks pretty good. Um, seatbelt compliance until you get to the back seat passengers, so that's, that's a, a big, big problem in terms of um, seatbelt compliance. So again, it helps us to know where to target any messages, whether they get through or not. Um, and then also use the data to monitor our service. So this is looking at time spent in the emergency department, which is um, probably not looking very good. And where, where to um, send our resources. So um, you know, where, which specialty is looking after our trauma patients and are they under the right specialty? It's something that we just keep an eye on. And of course, outcome monitoring. This is just looking at um, cause of death and those calls most common cause of death for our traumas is a major trauma, so head injury, which is probably not surprising. And just where are we going from here? I said I'd be very quick. Um, so we've, we've had about two years um, collaboration with our national counterparts to um, set up a program called the Australasian Trauma Quality Improvement Program. So the first part of this is setting up a national trauma registry. So we've spent about the last two years making sure that our, our <coughs> data elements are interpretation aligns with the um, national database, so that's all going really well and, and is under construction as we speak, so that's very imminent. Um, there are 26 major, the, the 26 Australian major trauma centres are going to be contributing to that initially. Um, down the track, I guess, we'll start looking at minor trauma, but at the moment it's just major trauma. Um, and then a spin-off from that is the National Quality Improvement Program. So we're currently developing key performance indicators that we can all be measuring so that we can all benchmark with each other. Um, we'll have some collaborative policy development and we'll be sharing our audit tools. And the next big thing for us, um, it's, I've had a business case in with HIN for 13 months now. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of folks somewhere else at the moment who are IT, but... Uh, <laughs> So we recognise there's a big, big, big gap in our data. We're only capturing patients that actually make it to Perth and to the Perth Registry Hospital. So we, um, we know that that's probably a good proportion of the significant trauma because most, people, most patients do get transferred there. There's obviously patients who die but don't make it um, to transfer and a lot of minor trauma would be still kept at the other hospital. So we're not picking that up at the moment. So we can't physically put you know, this level two very expensive Versus um, in, into all these sites, so we've got to look at some smarter um, electronic means of capturing the data. So that's the plan, and um, it's not quite happening yet. So 
in summary, um, any identified data that you would like for research, um, unfortunately, will need um, ethics review. Um, we can help you a lot with that, so um, feel free to um, open up that discussion. Aggregate data, generally, if it's stuff that we put in our report, we can give you an answer over the phone. Um, but if it's something a little bit more sensitive. So if you're going to ask me for how many NDAs did we have last year, I can tell you that. If you're going to ask me how many thoracotomies did we do in the UD and how many died, I might take that to our trauma committee because depending on what the purpose of the question was. Um, so, and just to remember, the main point I want to get across is that the State Trauma Registry is a data, State Trauma Registry database, not a State Trauma Registry. So we're, we're not a single entity. It's a single database that we individually <coughs> contribute to. So the data is owned at the individual hospitals and um, we are trying to streamline that process because obviously as we get bigger and um, advertise ourselves more and we would like to make it easier for you to access the data. So the first port of call if you email us at the State Trauma Office, um, I've got some clients there, um, and it will be <coughs> um, we can sort of start that process off for you and point you in the right direction. We can also use our data manager now to some of the really, um, coordination and discussion between the other registries in terms of getting um, consent uh, agreement for the other data custodians and students. I think someone's already firing the questions, so away you go. Oh, I was just interested, um, you said that when you capture the data, if the people are transferred to um, rehab or if they die. So does the State Rehab Centre capture their own data about what happens to those people? No, we, we follow them through. So, because at the moment the State, the State Rehab Centre is um, Shinto Park. So, um, until recently, until, well, until next year, that's always been considered part of Auckland Hospital. Because it's state rehab, we consider that part of their um, admission process. So we still collect that, and we still plan to, when they go to Fiona Stanley, we'll, we'll still collect state rehab patients. We won't follow patients that go off to Bentley or Armadale or you know, the step down services that are obviously going to going to happen for non tertiary rehab patients, but the tertiary rehab will continue to follow. Is, is there a uh, uh Certainly can um, sympathise with you with dealing with HIM. <laughs> <laughs> so we with that at the moment. Thanks, I heard you had to go. I do. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Okay, just bear with me and I'll set up the next presentation. Okay. Second presenter from Darlington Branch. We're going to hear um, how Darlington is put into practice and in, in relation to trauma. So we've got um, Diane Rosman, who's the program manager from Darlington, to present to us about a particular uh, bit of research that she's done. And um, I warned her that you might want to ask questions about overall Darlington at the end. So she's prepared for that too. Thank you. Now, can you all hear me, including those connected remotely? And I'm so glad that Maxine's described the trauma registry. I'm also so glad she's described those injury severity scores, which I don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll be tested later about what the ISS means, because I'm going to bring it up. Okay, um, so I'm from the Data Linkage Branch, but we also do have some um, money from the Road Trauma Trust account to actually connect data for road injury. So my presentation will focus on road trauma. And, um, but I'll talk, I'll just recap a little bit about data because um, you've probably whetted your appetite on the depth and breadth of information in the trauma registry, but 
but Maxine's also told you what its limitations are, that it's not a lot of things. So let's recap on WA Health data. There is lots of it, and you've probably been told about it this morning many, many times. But for injury, I suspect that hospital discharge records and emergency department presentations are the ones that you first think of when you think of looking for how many people were injured last year. But um, you probably, if you know what a hospital discharge record is, it's just a record for when someone went in and out of the hospital. And that's not necessarily, you, you can count the same person or the same event twice or three times or four times if you're not careful, if you don't have a way of counting them up. And you can double count people who are in emergency and people who then get appointed, etc. So that's WA Health data and it involves WA Health data custodians and the same data governance that Maxine described holds for those. The data custodians sit in a division for poor performance activity and quality, so they're not in public health. Um, there are also vital statistics sources of data that um, may help to get to the story of injury and what happens around an injury event. The births and marriages you may not be interested in just uh, for, for injury, but deaths certainly, death registrations to capture those people who died, especially before they got to the trauma centre for resuscitation. And they're managed by the Registry of Births, Deaths and Marriages, not the Department of Health. So another source of information, another group of people up the, that you have to convince that the data is needed. And when you're talking about road crashes, of course, it's very important if you want to do an intervention to know how it happened, where it happened, why it happened. And sources of information for crash data, we're lucky that in, in that particular discipline, that it is mandatory to report an accident if someone's injured. So crash reports go to police and on, on an online crash report form and to, to main roads scattered around town. Um, main roads collect information, they have the information about the road where it happened and the Insurance Commission, another government agency, um, collect information on the insurance claims, how much it costs, etc, etc. So I'm, I'm laying out a small squad for you of all the information you may want to tap into if you want to get to the bottom of this very complicated area. So, that's where data linkage can help you out. Um, but also, when examining injury, um, a lot of research design need to take into account comparable people who didn't get injured, comparable um, groups of people that didn't get injured. So the uninjured comparison groups are a study design that I'm sure you you probably know about. And sources of information when you're talking about road crashes at least, do you go to the electoral roll and pick off people who weren't injured at a particular point in time who could have had a road accident but didn't? Do you go to the licensed driver's source of information to see who was driving around potentially but who didn't crash? And do you look at birth cohorts where the kids who are walking around on the street um, and haven't yet got their driver's license or aren't able to vote yet? And again, another three departments, another three government agencies to deal with. And welcome to my life. Um, <laughs> so this is where data linkage comes in. And I, I think Jeff gave you this definition. I, I like this one. It's a technique. So it's a computer system. It's a nerdy way thing to do. But um, it's a technique for creating links between bits of information that can come from almost anywhere. But they're thought to relate to the same person in the case of an injury. But in the case of an injury, we're also interested in the place and the actual event or the time. So you need to take that into account. <coughs> the same person can have multiple injuries, obviously, in their lifetime. And let's just look at person X. The chain of events in their life, their book of life, if you like, um, starts with the birth, and then they get educated, and then they get on an electoral roll, and then they get married, and maybe they had a crash before that. And the crash generates several pieces of information all at once from the registry crash report, hospital report, insurance claim, all at once. And then later in life, mental illness, hospital and death, and it's very sad. But the, the book of life, if you like, everyone's got one. And in WA, we're really, really lucky that a lot of these administrative records uh, have been collected for a long time, since 1970, you know, back when I was even young. So um, data linkage is actually needed, even if you've only got hospital records because how do you know how to thread those events together? The hospital discharge out to Armadale, the, the rehab um, part of the event, the emergency that happened before they got admitted, if you don't connect the information together. And we call that finding the index event, finding the first thing that happened, 
then collecting or collating all the bits that go with the episode. Then you estimate the long-term outcomes if you're really interested in the depth of it all. Sort of keep collecting and linking data across years and hopefully you can look at some cost information. And there's a study that's looking at just this, um, or applied to look for it just now. But that's only about the injured. So you need to link up the data. This, this is, I guess, what I'm trying to emphasize here. And then find the comparison groups if that's what you want to do. So that brings me to some results. Um, let's say we've done all that. Linkage has happened. Linkage goes on in Western Australia. We've got 20 people in the data linkage branch doing this. Um, only six of them do linkage, but the rest are in the other part of the um, infrastructure. But anyway, given that all that infrastructure is in place, what can you do with it? So uh, who knows about the injury pyramid? It's an ancient concept that I'm sure you've all seen this, where you um, have a pyramid to denote the different levels of severity of injury across the population for a period of time. So this is a piece of work we did it's only, it's from 95 to 2007. I think Laura's involved in this now here. <laughs> this will be familiar. So first of all, you need to sort out who died, who didn't survive, get the 2,736 fatalities, put them in the top of the pyramid. Then the next level down, you'll need linked data to do that, to make sure you don't count those deaths again, and just pick from the trauma registry. Now, we did have access to the trauma data in all Perth when we did this work. Um, so the people who are in the trauma register, it was serious, but they survived. So that's the linkage and that's pulling out some information. There's 4,894 of those. So about double the number who died. Then there's another group of people who went to hospital made an insurance claim, so it was sort of serious, even though the trauma register didn't define it that way. And there's 21,000 of them. So you can see it getting broader and broader the, the lower the levels go in severity. And you can also have a stab at the bottom level, which is they went to hospital for an injury, but nothing else happened, so that couldn't have been too bad. So, so that's the injury pyramid, and um, we needed linked data to do that. So I'm going to tell you now where we got that data from. Essentially, the sources were the crash reports, the death register, the hospital admissions, the insurance claims, and the trauma registry. It's all linked together in order to get that sort of pyramid you just saw. And you can build one of those too if you apply for the data. Um, now, at the moment, as I said, the data linkage branch is lucky to have a focus on road injury. We've been able to get some funding from the Road Trauma Trust account to do some projects. So we have an analysis team, a research group, as well as the linkage team. And we're focusing at the moment on injury severity scores. So for those um, injured uh, crash casualties who didn't get onto the trauma register, or who we, we need to be able to look at the injury severity of those in some way. I'll, I'll tell you how in a minute. Um, we're doing some work on crash and injury risk factors with the Office of Road Safety. We're looking at injured cyclists, that's a master's um, student, and the burden of injury is some work that's happening <coughs> in um, chronic disease prevention. So, um, I just want to show you this, this table, focus on it for a minute, I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, this is more recent, and it's just been done on Friday before one of our staff headed off to Brisbane to the road safety conference that's going on there at the minute. Um, so these are road crash casualties. There's some numbers on there that tell you the admissions, the number of admissions. So let's just look at 2006. So if you look at the hospital records, count <coughs> all of the hospitals that had an injury or traffic. Now, I'll tell you what traffic means in a minute. That group of people, there are 4,004 of them. But when it dropped down to levels on the next Miss, miss the next row and take the red ones. There are actually 3,185 of those if you count episodes. So that's collating those things, those busy hospital ins and outs that were going on for individuals. So linked data can tell you it went from 4,004 to 3,185. Okay, so that's the number you should count, the red one, for the number of hospital episodes in 2006. And you can read along that line, it's kind of going up. <coughs> 2007, 3418, 2008, 3659, right up to 2010, it's 3917. Now, um, that's the hospital people. Now, the next table underneath that is the people who died. But as Maxine alluded to, some people <coughs> who actually die do get to hospital first. So they 
they are those ones in the red line at the top of the desk, the ones who were admitted and then died. So you have to take them off the other red number before you add on the deaths, which is the bottom red number. So can you look down to 2006? You've got 3,185 in hospital. Take away 36 and add 186. And you can say that in 2006 there was how many? Killed or seriously injured? Who's, who's done it? No. Okay, it's it's 150, so it's 4,335, right? Am I right or wrong? My mental arithmetic is correct. Anyway, that's what you have to do, right? So you don't double count. You need linked data to do that. And you can see for the other years that it's around 200 people die each year on the roads, and it's been stable like that for years, years and years and years. So the rate is going down, but the number is stable. And it's around 3,500 who are hospitalised. Now in those hospitalised ones, we haven't said who's serious and who isn't. So if we wanted to know who is serious and who isn't, how would you assess that? Now before I came here, I was reading a report um, prepared by a European um, select committee of some kind that were proposing what serious injury should be defined as. And the only thing you can do internationally is really hospital stay as greater than a day because a lot of other things you have to derive using lots of sources of data. But in WA, of course, we're well placed to look at some other things. So there's this measure called the ICISS. Now, who other than what that is? Ever heard of the ICISS? Well, it's an... No, it's an... Well, it's IC stands for the, the classification of disease. It's a diagnosis-based survival thing. So it's sort of a pseudo-severity score, but it's... It's based on the survivability or the survival risk ratio of particular diagnoses, injury diagnoses. And they've done a lot of work in New Zealand on this and set some thresholds that are sort of mirror the AIS level. So if you don't have an AIS, which is, you know what that is, don't you, because Maxine told you. And the ISS being greater than 15, it means it's major. So those things, we could use any of those if we wanted to sort out who was seriously injured. So here again is what the ICISS means. It's a diagnosis-based injury severity score. To get it, you select the cases that had a principal diagnosis of injury. So the main thing they were in hospital for was injury. You calculate the survival risk ratio for the injury diagnosis mentioned in that hospital record, and you multiply them all together, and you come up with a score. And you magically say, if 4% of the people or more die, that's what the New Zealanders said. But it requires linked data to get these sort of scores. Um, and so, I want to show you some other numbers. And um, this is road crash casualties again in WA. And again, it's, it's fairly old data because we haven't done this again. We're about to do it now. So this is bank, uh, killed and seriously injured. If, if the Road Safety Council in West Australia wants to measure more than the road tolls more than the ones who died. That is their absolute have been dying to do that for ages. And so killed and seriously injured is a measure. So you combine those that died and those that were seriously injured. And if you look at the police reports that are reported, this is the graph you see. Any surprises? What happened in 2001? Ran from the freeway? Or did they lose the data? <laughs> well, what happened in the hospital? Red one is the hospital admission data. There's no doc. And the numbers in the, the police crash reports, I should mention, I reported either self reported, I went to hospital, or police see you going off an ambulance after a crash. So it's, it's a kind of strange measure. And that, we've known that for years and years, but that's not the way to do it, but that's what's reported in the official stats at the moment. The hospital records tell you that, and told us back in 2002 that it wasn't happening. You know, don't get excited about the Frank Graham Farmer Freeway. It doesn't make any difference. Um, <laughs> but so, um, um, that red line is all of the hospital admissions, and the yellow line is if we use this new magic ICISS thing to just sort out those that are serious. And you get a lower number, right? But it's got a similar trend. 
Um, and how does that fit with what the trauma registry, official international AIS and ISS measures are? Well, this is nice because it fits between those two things. So this shows you that the ICIS isn't a bad measure of digital severity. It's somewhere between the very major trauma that's measured by ISS being greater than 15 and a little bit less than the more, the higher number, which is when you've got one body region that's injured seriously. Okay, so that's, when you say how many people were seriously injured, take a look at the graphs. You know, which one would you like? So that's, that's one story we can tell. And um, the other story I wanted you to tell, to tell you just as we close, and I'll sort of take questions after this, is there is a special case with bicyclists. Is anyone focusing on bicycle injuries? Because that story is even worse than the one I've just described in terms of where you get the numbers from and what it all means. Um, if you take the records that are reported to police, the bicyclists that think about going and putting a crash report on the end, you get a completely different picture than if you get the hospital records. And that again has been recognised for ages. But um, so you can count the ones that are presented to emergency, the ones that stay overnight only, and then you have the trouble with it when you take the hospital records about whether or not the accident occurred on the road or not, should you count it or not, etc. Was it on a bike path, was it in a field, was it in a quad bike, was it in a sandhill, blah blah. So um, the, the case of bicycle accidents, the case of scope is quite tricky. So here's some more numbers, just hot off the press this week. Um, these are pedal cyclists from, I mentioned um, Jessica Lee's doing masters in, on this topic and she's just sorted her data, she's taken a month to get all of her data and clean it up and count the episodes and we've struggled about how to do that and finally got to it. So if you take, again, I want you to focus on the reported ones, so they were people who went to the police station and reported something, or they went online and reported it on what's called the online crash report form. <coughs> so if you again look at the year 2006, the first column, the third row, the police said in 2006, 42 cyclists were admitted to hospital. Uh -huh. Not a problem, we shouldn't do anything about that, let's focus on cars. Um, and then if you look at the hospital data though, same column, third row down, already taken into account that they have to be defined to be traffic accidents, which means someone said it happened on a road, and you've collapsed already all of the hospital events that are related to the same things, you're not double counting, it's 402. A different sort of problem, right? It's, much, it's 10 times the size. So if we didn't have linked data, we wouldn't be able to really tell you that story. But you can see that the number of cyclists, if you look at the hospital data, is increasing the number of injured cyclists. And the number of, there's still a fair increase if you look at the police reports too, but completely different picture. So I don't want to labour the point, I just wanted to show you that the stats depend very much on how you define things, they depend very much on how you frame your question. If someone else is going to do the analysis for you, the question you ask, very important. So I just wanted to leave you with some of those question marks um, and I can't go any further with that data because we haven't done it yet, we're about to do it this week and um, that's where I thought I'd stop and you can ask me questions and I will take questions on data linkage in general but if you want to look up our website that's it under there.
Just a purely curious question, how long does it take to create one of those triangles, the injury triangle? Because when you talk, you make it sound so easy. On a practical level, how long does it actually take to put one of those together? When you've got your data in front of you, all linked up, all cleaned up, with all the right numbers, got all the permissions, someone's delivered it to your desktop, you can do that in half a day. But the time to get approval to get all that together, months. The time to get the data onto your desktop, months. But once you've got it, you can churn that out. I think that's fair, fair comment. Those in epidemiology, um, I'm not telling you anything new. <laughs>
So where, where we will invest money for health promotion programs, what age group is at greatest need? The leading causes of injury, hospitalisations and mortality, you can see there hospitalisations first, so for those particular age groups, zero to four, falls is the greatest cause of hospitalisation for kids, as is for the, all of them up to 14 years. Then as we get a bit older, uh, teenagers, uh, transport is the leading cause of hospitalisation, and then we go back to falls, and falls again up into the older ages. And we did see earlier that females um, are stronger in that 65 years of age for falls, but males are predominantly greater in all other areas. Looking at cause of death, for, the, for our little ones, drowning is still the leading cause of death. Then we have transport, and then suicide as we go um, up the years and back to falls as the leading cause of death. So that information directly um, influences the decisions that the injury policy team make. And so we're getting stacked up here together on our really cool bike. And um, it's all of us involved together to get the correct information. So here's some further data that we've used from the epidemiology report um, to identify target groups. So um, on our team earlier today, we, we um, talked about the fact that alcohol actually covers so many injury areas. So health, Department of Health policy team, we need to make sure that if somebody's going to be doing um, a program in transport, if somebody's going to do a health promotion program in any injury area, we have identified that they're priority areas and they'll need to be addressed through all types of injury work. So direction for the WA, WA Health, we know that alcohol is a contributing factor to approximately 19% of deaths and 12% of hospitalisations. And that becomes a risk from the teenage years. So if there's um, a program looking at um, injury prevention, well, we want that area of that program to be considering alcohol as an issue. We know that um, falls in children and um, up to 14 years and people over 65, the hospitalisations are really important in that area. Injury deaths for males, we've mentioned, have been, uh, is higher than females across the lifespan, except for falls in, in the end of um, senior years. People living in disadvantaged areas are 3.1 times more likely to be hospitalised and 9.1 times more likely to die as a result of those injuries. And as we know, Aboriginal people um, suffer a greater incidence of injury in that they're 2.8 times more likely to present to an emergency department and 2.9 times more likely to be hospitalised and 3. Um, not 6 times more likely to die due to an injury. So this is the bike that I would ride. <laughs> He would take photos of my desk because there's so much pink on my desk at work, so I like this one. Um, the data that the Department of Health receives influences our policy direction for purchasing services. Now, the Department of Health injury policy team outsource health promotion programs, so we work with non-government organisations to, who then themselves utilise the EPI branch to personalise data to their, to their particular area of um, interest. So, for example, Kids Save WA and Royal Life Saving Society, they themselves as NGOs, who are funded by the policy team at the Department of Health, work with the EPI branch to get data that's specific to the areas that they work on. So, for example, Royal Life Saving Society run a program called Don't Drink and Drink, I don't drink and drown, and so they would work with the EPI branch to make sure they've got the correct stats around teenage drinking and um, young adult drinking. Kids Safe do really important um, uh, EPI information around um, the stats around children's uh, injury areas, and so they would be able to tell us that um, children suffer injuries in the home much more than outside of the home. Now they've, done, they've worked that out because they worked with the EPI branch to find that. Just a couple more slides. A really important policy
policy um, framework for um, injury prevention. And you may have heard of um, the WA Health Promoting Strategic Framework. That's a policy document that directs where injury prevention investment by health will go. And so in developing this document, the Department of Health worked closely, in my area, worked closely with um, the epidemiology branch to come up with injury prevention priority areas for the next five years, or until 2016 now. <coughs> so those priority areas that the Department of Health now focus on is to reduce road crashes and road trauma, prevent falls in older people, protect children from injury, improve water safety, and reduce interpersonal violence. And this um, framework goes into great detail about that, but those priority areas have only been established through the information that we've received um, from the epidemiology branch. But also, as Peter uh, mentioned earlier this morning, the epi branch is one really important uh, value source of data. Um, we also then, to, to ensure that the direction that WA Health is taking for policy, we then also work very closely and look at other national data sources. And mentioned as already today is the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, which is that document on your far right. It's just one of many, many documents they provide. And um, other national policy documents as well. So my, my little talk was very quick, just to show you how in the policy side of things, EPI actually does provide such a lot of influence and that we really couldn't make the decisions around investing health money without um, the data that we get from the EPI branch and certainly through data linkage in the um, research projects that we undertake. And so rather than riding a bike with Dora and Boots, we'll be on these super modern, super fast track to good knowledge. <laughs>